Hello and welcome to the Nash Tackle Off The Hook podcast. Just to make you aware, this podcast may contain some explicit slash offensive language. And if that's not your thing, you don't have to listen. But I have given you a warning. I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. You don't know the half of it, but yeah, um, anyway. So I'm, yeah, I'm, on a, I'm skating on the thinnest <laughs> ice known to man. Like. He said, and um, they put a poison in the tank that just instantly kills them. He went, and we've run out of it, so we cut their heads off with shovels. Suddenly, bang! The whole boat exploded. Take your sort of eight-inch long piranha and imagine that at four, five, maybe six feet. I said, I've revived your dead fish. <laughs> F off, he said. You haven't. That was just humongous. It was... I couldn't believe what I was looking at. I'm just battling this fish out and I'm, I know it's a black man. I'm, yeah. I'm saying I'll never be a naughty boy again. If you catch fish and you return them to the water, then you are my brother. Elliot Gray, welcome to the Nash Podcast, mate. Thank you for coming in. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Living the dream? Yeah, sort of. <laughs> sort of. So I've been fishing or not? I have been... No, I haven't been fishing since the end of November. Right. So quite a while. That is a while. But I don't fish in December, generally. December, because I'm away a lot throughout the year, fishing or working. December, pretty much always spent at home. Sometimes I fish till like mid-December. I was going to fish throughout the whole winter, but I caught the carp. My winter target, I caught the last couple of days of November. So since then, I've been in limbo. Um, I've been driving up to Oxford. I'm fishing up there this year, and I've started to prime that lake. So last two week, last two Sundays, driven up to Oxford, done a bit of trimming, been out in the boat, put a bit of salt in, bit of hemp in, nice. just starting to prime that. So I'll probably start fishing there mid March. Just a fair layoff that. In between that time, filming or not at all? Yeah, I've been. Yeah, because of, you know because I'm not fishing, I'm yeah. trying to get as much in filming wise as I can. I've done a few interviews. Obviously, this time of year, the filming side of things, I think in the winter in the UK, you're kind of you're always up against it. So we try to get a lot of our content done in the autumn when it's still good. We still film throughout the winter uh, on the bank stuff, but a little bit more selective with it, with it these days. Mm. So we've got content in the bag, which means we're not scratching around to try and get good content in the winter, which is hard. It is hard. Yeah, definitely. To get something that's, you know, we've, we, we like to think we set our standards quite high these days. And... We're more selective, and by having a lot of stuff shot prior to the winter, we're able to, you know, we're putting stuff out now that's been shot last summer, you know. So yeah, nice. you got a buffer. Yeah, so I've been out and about interviews mainly, um, but we're still filming other stuff. You know, we're, we're, always, we're always filming stuff, but gone are the days where, you know, when, when sobography started, we were working to the wire all the time, really. Mm. And yeah. actually what happens in the winter is you end up with stuff that is, you know, we always think we end up with a good film because the characters are good and actually you don't have to catch a carp every time to make a good film. But it's nice to have that slight cushion these days and um, we can pick our filming trips, etc. Nice. More wisely, yeah. We're going to talk all things topography later. Yeah. Um, I've definitely consumed a lot of content um, since having Rich in. Mm. He's inspired me to watch a bit, mate. So it's, it's real good. I've really enjoyed it, mate. Thank but we'll, as I said, we'll talk later in the podcast about that. We're going to talk about you and your angling. Yep. Okay. And we're going to attack this in sort of a slightly different way. We talked over the phone instead yeah. of just going through a chronological list of captures mm-hmm. atypically. We're going to look at what angling is to you and your angling. And I think ever since you came to sort of... I don't know, profile in terms of media. We'll talk about how that came to mm-hmm. be. Your angling has always been centred around target fishing. Where yeah. where did that stem from? Why hasn't it ever been numbers or, or has it ever been numbers at one stage? No, it's never been numbers, never. I can't think of a time where... The, the only time I can think of where it's been numbers as such, that is when I joined a lake a couple of years ago. I wanted to fish it for 10 odd years. It took me 10 years to get the ticket. The carp in that lake are so nice across, you know, the entire stock is so nice mm. that you go there with the, you go there with, a, I'll just catch as many of these carp as I can. To find nice for me. They're the best, some of the best carp I've ever fished for. They're, they're beautiful. Old. A lot of them are linears. There's the com- Every carp in that lake is incredible bar maybe a handful, mm. but say you've got a stock of 80 carp, 75 of them are 
you know, if you put them on Instagram, people will go, wow, that's a nice fish, you know, and that isn't the case in most lakes. What? So going back to your question about the target fishing, a lot of the lakes I grew up fishing as a kid, club waters, also syndicates, but um, generally you have one carp in a lake. And for me, there's something far more interesting about setting yourself a target of catching one fish than just going down there with a, I always want to catch as many carp as I can. Right. And I always have since I was young. I always want to, if I can, I want to catch the most. I want to be, I want to catch more than anyone. But the, obviously the most important thing is catching that carp that you want to catch. And I find it far more easy, far easier to be consumed by that campaign when I have one or two, some, you know, sometimes it's two, but generally one or two fish to, you know, base everything I'm doing around. And when, obviously when you catch them, it's been said loads of times, when you catch the carp you want to catch, that's a far better feeling than just racking up numbers. So it, it stems from the waters I fished yeah. because actually that's kind of, in a way, it's how it has to be on those lakes. You know, you there is only one big one or there's one carp that stands out above the rest and it's like a natural, I didn't, you never like, I never chose for things to be that way, but over time that's what I like to do and that's, what the waters I fished have kind of lent themselves to as well. Give me your first sort of target that you you set about and, and achieved. So, so I'd say the the first one would be years and years ago. I was fifteen years old. Um, I start. I used to fish a lake around the corner, sort of where I learnt to carp fish, and we went over to another lake around the corner, which was to us was renowned as being you know, a step up and it was a step up and the, I wanted to catch the biggest common in the lake. Weirdly, I did catch it within a couple of days of being there and I didn't actually know it was it, um, (laughs) which sounds silly, but I was 15. Hadn't seen many pictures of it. We just knew it was in there. I think I'd only ever seen one photo of it and um, yeah, I caught it and I didn't know it was it. I was, I was a bit unsure, you know. How big was it? It was 36, hence the thing. So it it was spawned out. I think it had done 40 pound that year, spawned out at 36. And, uh, yeah, between me and my mate, we were like, is wow, it? this is a different one. This is a, like, and it wasn't, it was the, but that was, you know, that, that was the first carp I tried to target and caught it and didn't even know it was it for a couple of days, you know, <laughs> which sounds silly, but it was more about going onto that lake that had this big carp in it, we didn't necessarily know what it, like I say, we didn't know what really what it looked like. Mm. It was more knowing that there was a big carp in there. We were used to, like, we were used to fishing for carp that if you had caught a 20 pounder, you was lucky. So mm. to go there and fish for a carp that had been 40 pound, you know, so when you catch it at 36, obviously I'm 15 years old, I'm not quite as aware of, yeah, of course the not. spawning out things, or you know, that sort of stuff at that time at 15, um, which is a long time ago now. Um, but yeah, that was the first carp in my head. That was more of a kind of yeah, a thought process. I'm gonna go it, and catch. Oh, we want to catch that one. Yeah. Um, and from there, you know, I just I, I fished a lot when I was a kid. Like, um, when I left school. When did you leave school? Sixteen. Sixteen. Yeah. So GCSEs done, and then off, yeah, did my then... GCSE. So I actually stopped fishing when I was fifteen. Right. Yeah, I was right into my fishing from about twelve. So 14, um, then I started, I started going out just doing kids stuff, yeah. playing football and throughout the la- latter part of my school days, I stopped fishing in the winter that I finished school that last year, <laughs> this is going to sound stupid. I bought, I got a set of Delkims yeah. and that was my like inspiration to go out fishing again. So I wanted to use them. Yeah. They were that these like, they spoke, you know, these were these incredible things and, uh, I went out in the winter and started fishing. And from that winter, I fished a lot, inspired by my Delkims to go fishing. I'd always loved it. Ever since I was a kid, I've fished since I was yeah. very young. My dad does. My dad did, sorry, still does. My granddad did. He's passed away now. Um, but it's in my, my brother doesn't, but it's in my family to, to go fishing. Yeah. And <clears throat> that winter and spring, I fished a lot, finished school. And when I left school, I pretty much went full time. Did you? Yeah. Well, I think in the summer holidays, I spent eight days at home out of the whole summer holiday break between then and college. Fair play. Eight or nine. We were doing like twenty day sessions all around Essex. Just yeah, one a couple at one lake. 
One lake. That club, that lake where I caught the big comma oh, from, right. I carried on fishing there. I caught it then. So when I left school, I, which was in June or whatever, yeah. um, I wasn't allowed to prom. I was supposed to be going to prom, wasn't allowed to go to prom. <laughs> Why weren't you allowed to uh, prom? Throwing potatoes in school in the last couple. What they did, our school was quite bad. And, um, <laughs> yeah, our school was quite bad. Uh, it got to a point where I think the year after we left, it got put on special measures. Right. Um, a lot changed. Now it's a really good school, but when we were there, it wasn't great. And we were quite a bad year in terms of, we weren't bad kids. We just fucked, you know, we messed around. Um, and things like, you know, we, we had an obsession for throwing things. and um, Potatoes. Yeah, I got caught throwing a potato. And what they did to us was anyone who was misbehaving around leaving school, you know, it's like end of this end of the school year, or certainly at our school, it was carnage, mate. That last week, yeah, they used brought. to keep us locked in like for the last week, things like that. So we <laughs> we weren't allowed out. Our lunch breaks were different times, all that sort of stuff. But I wasn't allowed to prom, um, and then I was allowed. Then they did let me. What? So they reversed just, the decision? Yeah, just before prom, because I got on with the teachers. I wasn't like, yeah, I wasn't a bad kid or anything. Just we, just, we just messed around, and you know, and they had to set, they had to put rules in place that stopped try to deter people from, like I say, we weren't bad kids at all. We just messed about. And um, so then I said, that they said I could go to prom. I didn't go. And um, I ended up catching that common that week. And then from there, I fished all through the summer holidays with a mate of mine. And like I say, we were doing 20, like 18 nights, 10 nights, 12, whatever. We, we were there all the time. Uh. Get food brought down by my mum. When it came to going to college, I didn't want to go to college by that point. I was pretty much, I just wanted to fish. It's all a, I'd made my mind up really then. My mum and dad are quite well, they're, they're quite well educated. They are um, the sort of people that want you to go to college and get an education because they realise the importance of it. Mm. At the time, I, I didn't see it that way. You know, I just wanted to do, and I've always been that way. I just wanted to do what I wanted to do. Um, I did go to college but for only for about three months. Um, and then I, I wasn't, I got asked to leave the college. Um, I wasn't really going to the lessons. I didn't, I just didn't like it. It felt like, felt like being back at school and I'd just spent best part of three months in a company of men. Yeah. You know, I'm 15, 16, but I'm with men cause I'm fishing and the people that surrounded me, the people I, who were actually becoming my closest friends were 15 years older than me. And I didn't want to go back to college. And when I did go back, I didn't like it. I felt, no. didn't feel out of place because, you know, but in a way I did feel out of place because I didn't feel like I wanted to be there. The people I'd met at the college, I didn't really like them. That was all right. But I had no one there that I went to do English, art and business studies. Um, right. And the people that surrounded me, I just, I just didn't really like it. So I left that college. I think I started fishing again quite a lot. Then I went and did a chef's course. Chef. To be a chef, yeah, I love cooking. Still yeah. do, to, yeah, love it. Yeah, still do to this day. Quite a good cook, actually. Um, but yeah, I like cooking, I, and it was just another thing I liked to do it. So I thought I'll do that, but I hated it. I hated that college. It was too. Is it just the educational setting? That you no, like? it's not what even that. The, like, it was mostly I didn't want to be at college. I wanted to be fishing, yeah. and I decided, you know, that's the type. Are you at that age? Everyone around you is deciding what do they, what do you want to do with your life? And for me, for if I wanted to do business, do something in business, I'd have gone to college and I'd have, I'd have liked it. If in my heart I wanted to be a chef, I would have liked it a lot more than I did. But I didn't. I didn't. That isn't what I wanted to do. Yeah. Um, and because of that, it became a, a barrier for me to actually yeah. really get involved in it. I had to wear a hairnet all the time. You had to, uh, all these stupid shoes you have to wear. It was just loads of little silly things. And again, the people that surrounded me didn't really like them. They were... I think they were, I've got a feeling they were a year, so a lot of them were quite a bit younger than me. Can't remember right. why that was. Maybe I was a year, like it was a year, I was a, with people a year younger than me, I think, when I, was, when I did okay. my chef's course. But just weren't the right fit. No, and again, like I said, I'm hanging around with, I'm spending my time, all of my free time with men. Yeah. Who are very, very different. Definitely. To 17 and 16 year old kids out of college. And That's even though I was one of those kids out of college, I didn't feel like it. You know, I wasn't a kid out of college. No. As far as I was concerned, I was not a kid out of college. Didn't want to be at college. And I'm not the sort of person that if you're, if you tell me to do something and I don't want to do it, I find it very, very hard 
to do yeah, it. Yeah, you seem like you know your own mind pretty yeah. early doors. And I always have done. What was fishing, how was fishing received in terms of you going fishing during like GCSE years and through school? Did people just think it was weird? Did you talk about no, it? No, no, no. Because when I, so what happened was when I was at school, when I said, like say, when I was sort of between 12 and 14, there was only two of us that fished. Yeah. In the period that I didn't fish, started playing football more and going out and that a lot more, about 10 of my mates started to fish. Right. So when I came back to it, there was all of a sudden, there was loads of us. Um, when we left school through the holidays, there were still quite a few of us doing it. But as we, we hit college and all that, it did sort of fade out. But it was never, it was perceived as weird by people I played, some of the lads I played football with, things like that. They found it a bit weird because they weren't of that ilk. They weren't into it. And I think back then, fishing was all, was certainly a bit weirder. Um, Nowadays, not so much. It's, it's a far broader. There's, there's a lot more people that do fishing. And actually, one of the lads who took the piss out of me, he's one of our best mates, he ripped the shit out of me my whole life for going fishing. He <laughs> plays semi-pro football. He's like, really fancies himself. You know, he's a yeah. good-looking lad, great footballer. And he was just always on me about What's, how what was he weird fishing was. What was he he's, giving He used to say, like, what? He'd, ring me, he'd text me or ring me. He's like, why? All you post on your Instagram is, is leaves and reeds or... You know, walk, trees yeah. and reeds or leaves and fish. And he's just like, what? He just never got it. He's now obsessed with carp fishing. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, and I always used to say to him, like, you know me, I'm not a weirdo. I'm not a strange person or whatever. Fishing's good. And uh, he see the light now, but. <laughs> <laughs> Seen the light. Yeah. like, But that period after school, it was a big, like I said, I'd made my mind up what I wanted to do. And actually at the time, all I wanted to do was be a, I just wanted to be a fisherman. Inspired How did that play by, out with your parents? They was all right to start with. Like, didn't I wasn't a troublesome kid, but I didn't get on that great with my mum and dad. I was a little bit, well, I was quite rebellious. Um, and they they supported me massively throughout the holidays. And they've always have done because they, they've always seen in me what I saw in myself, if you know what I mean. They've always seen that. But the reality of it, if you've got a kid... I know there might be people out there now listening to this who've got a kid who wants to do something that seems really weird. You know, you might have a kid who want when he's 16, he's like, oh, I want to make a living out of this strange thing. Yeah. The odds of succeeding might seem slim, might seem, and I guess it's down to you as a parent to, obviously I've got kids now, it's down to you as a parent to support them as much as you can whilst also supporting them in another way of just maybe not, I think it did me, Good that my mum and dad didn't just go, all right, just go off and do that then. I think yeah. they're them kind of wanting to stop, not stop me, that's the completely the wrong word, I suppose, but having someone giving you a different side to it, maybe thing, maybe making you realise if you want to make something work or if you want to do this, you have to consider other things. That's important because it did. And I think as a kid, that helped me. It actually made me want it more and try harder. If they'd have just gone, okay, go off with the wind and just go fishing all the time, I think the outcomes could have been different to what mm. happened. But having that, being kept grounded in a sense of, you need this, you need that, you have to always think of, you know, how are you going to make that work? How is this going to happen? How? And in reality, you know, I, all I wanted to do was be a fisherman. Yeah, exactly. Like, like inspired by Derek Ritchie, who I'd met and spent a lot of time with. He got paid to go carp fishing. That's what I wanted to do. Um, was the first time you met the Don? When was it? Yeah, I did a tuition with him. My dad bought it for me when I was like thirteen. I caught my first thirty pounder with Derek. Uh, over thirty Ave- pounder at thirteen. Yeah, over at Averley. Yeah, yeah. Jeez. Yeah. So uh, that's when I first met him, and then I fished on. I fished with him a, f- a fair bit years down the line. Um, Starstruck or like no? Nah, yeah, nah. Because it. I w- maybe when I was a kid, because I, I. My fishing, I think it's probably different quite different now with younger lads. They're probably quite heavily invested in social media, magazines, mm. things like topography, I suppose, watching. And I wasn't really like that. I used to read I used to read Total Cart. That was it. I didn't, I wasn't like, I wasn't into anything. I just liked going fishing. It wasn't so much about, I wasn't engulfing myself in everything cart fishing in terms of all the magazines, all the videos. There's loads of stuff from that era I've never watched or seen. Right. We just liked going fishing. It wasn't about. I don't. I don't now. I don't like reading about fishing. I don't really watch any fishing even now, and I didn't back then. I just like going fishing, you know. So he, Derek was. 
I wasn't starstruck by Derek. No, I was influenced by him, by the lifestyle he led and the fact he was a nice guy who gave, don't get me wrong, he was the guy in Total Carp all the time. So there was yeah. an element of, yeah. oh, it's Derek Ritchie. But quite quickly, he just became Del, you know. He just become another guy that I got on with down the fishing lake. But his lifestyle, the way he lived his life was a massive inspiration for how I wanted to then. He is what made me realise there is opportunities out there to do something like that. Mm. If I'd never met Del, maybe I wouldn't have had that because I saw it firsthand with Derek. And if you don't see it firsthand, which I probably wouldn't have done, maybe I would never have even felt that way. Maybe I never would have wanted to just go fishing all the time. But meeting him at a young age, 16, 15, 16, showed me that actually there is a, that yeah. is out the there. Possibility, yeah. Yeah. And it did, it had a big influence on me. But yeah, my parents supported me. They always reminded me that, you know, you need to, you need to have a backup plan. And they always wanted me to be, to still get an education. You know, they did. So I did, um, first, like I said, I did business, art and English. Then I did a chef's course. And then I actually trained to be a plumber after that. Yeah? Yeah. And I lost my job when I was, I think I was about 18. So I think I'd had a, like, pretty much another gap year. Um, in fact, I did, yeah. Just fishing? No, I did. I did get a job somewhere. I got a job. Um, I used to make, uh, I used to make, Bite like conservatory doors. Okay. I hated it. I got sacked from there. I actually got sacked. I was up the tree at Carthagena when I got sacked. I'd called in sick. I was up the top of a tree at Carthagena. And he just said, don't, just don't come back. Um, but I did that for quite a while. My friend who I'd met down the lake. Right. He's called Chris Cox. Um, he got me that job. But I didn't like it, mate. I just, all I wanted to do was go fishing. Um, so yeah, I had that job. Then I trained to be a plumber with another guy I met through fishing. I was his apprentice. And I, was, I quite enjoyed that. So I like to get my hands dirty. I actually practical. Yeah. yeah, it was out and about. It kept me like, and I still fished a lot around it. Mm. He asked me not to fish too much around it because he could he could tell, you know, how much it would. Because I'd fish all the time if I could between yeah. work after work, blah blah blah. Um, but I lost my job the day I started. So I trained to be a plumber as an apprentice, but I wasn't at college. And then the day I was going to start college, two days before I was going to start college, we had the recession, and I lost my apprenticeship. Oh. I was just about to start college. I'd been inducted, everything ready to go. And um, I lost that job. Started fishing again, met Neil Spooner. And then I kind of got my foot in the door at Corder. And then the day I was going to start a Corder, or two days before I was going to start a Corder, he rang me back up and was like, oh, sort of recession's eased. Do you want your job back? Oh, I thought you meant Nick. I thought you meant Spooner. No, no, no. no. You so I was about guy. to start a Corder. I'd, had, had, I'd stopped the plumbing for probably six to eight months or something, I'd guess, off the top of my head. And then as I'm about to start a quarter, he's run me back up. Oh, your job, you can have your job back now. And obviously I said, no, you know, I'm, I'm going to go down this road. Like, And I started working at quarter. So it's pretty organic then. So you met Neil fishing, I'm guessing. Yeah, so yeah. on a some Essex water, you were fishing. Yeah, Lakelands, then... place called Lakelands, yeah. And then yeah. from there, there's you sort of one route into the industry. Yeah, that was my, and I just said to Neil like, at the time, I was I was never looking for full time work, so I made that quite clear from the start. You just wanted to go fishing. I didn't wanted you? something. Um, I don't. Yeah, you know, do you want to work at Corder when you're seven? Of course you do. You know, um, I didn't care what. I think I just said to him, "Look, I'll do anything. Work in a warehouse, whatever. I don't really care." But I am. Um, <clears throat> I got a. I become like Tom. Sounds weird to say it because we're pretty much the same age, but I kind of became Tom Dove's apprentice. Yeah. Um, I did customer service. And yeah, worked with Tom, me and Tom. Really how like. how was that like it's good. going into like industry, but it's fishing, isn't it, as well at the yeah. same time? That was you know, that was quite um I suppose that was I wouldn't say I don't know if I'd say daunting is the right word, but I wanted to do that. Yeah. You know, so I had a slightly different it weren't like rocking up at college for the first time. No. I wanted to do this, you know. Um and I basically managed to secure like I think I did three days a week. Perfect. So I fished two or three days a week and I I worked there with Dovey. Um I was in the office with Damo, Dovey, Penning and Dan. <laughs> Upst- yeah, upstairs in the big office, like with them. What was that like? Walking in there fresh off the old It was good. Day, like. I had my ups and we had our ups and downs. Like I was always a bit of a liability in terms of being late or, you know, um <laughs> again not wanting to do things and I, had a, I didn't have a rough time. That would be the wrong way. But they I've said this before. Um, 
I think I said it on the Calder podcast, you know, but I owe a lot to them for sticking by me. Yeah. Yeah. Because now that I run my own business, I see how much of a fucking pain in the ass I probably was. Was it the authority thing again? What was it? Oh, no, I don't know. I don't think it was authority. It was more the novelty wears off. Right. Do you know what I mean? When you first start, you know, like I said to you, oh, we'll do anything. Yeah. Just to get a job there. After a while, you suddenly think, oh, I've been doing this for a while now. I don't like that bit of it or I don't like this bit of it. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, that's just what I'm like. I like to progress quite quickly in things. I'm not a, um, I'm not a stand stiller. Yeah, you can't you know. just. Coast. Yeah, I want to do better things as quickly as I can. Also, you're quite self driven, aren't you? you whatever yeah, yeah, you, yeah, yeah. Whatever you sort of set out and think, yeah, you'll 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 give it your all. Yeah. But if it's not that way, as soon as something becomes normal, yeah, or as soon as something like becomes samey, or then I don't really want to do it. You know, I want to change. I want to. I want to better it. I'll just because I just how I am. I don't have the. Um, do you think that's why target fishing is is hundred yeah, percent, mate? Yeah, hundred percent. You can go and catch numbers anywhere. Yeah, like. yeah, doesn't it? Yeah, no, that is exactly why I'm like it in everything. Um, I'm like it in my work. I'm like it in my fishing. I work hard. Yeah. At, when I'm working, I work hard. I, you know, Gemma drags me indoors all the time. I'd sit in my office for hours and hours and hours and hours. Like through the first lockdown, I worked all day every day because mm. I actually like doing it. Like. And things, um, I'm like it with everything. You know, if I go in the garden on a Saturday to, to sort the garden out, I will stay out there till it's dark doing every single inch of the garden because once I start doing something, I get really, I get really into it. And it's no different with my work, all my fishing, all my gardening, or but it, it doesn't matter what it is. But it's hard to balance that now. It's quite a common trait that I've seen in quite a lot of, yeah. of like, if you like big carp anglers that are target fishermen, that, that they've got almost like a quite strong addictive personality, but that that always has seemed to be quite hard for them to temper between family life and all the other elements that you try and balance. You said there that when you obviously when you're 17, 18, you just want to go fishing, mm. don't care about anything else. But obviously, as life progresses and you've got dependents and other things and it can be, it can be a hard balancing act that mate. no two ways about it. How have you managed to, to factor that in with regards to, to sort of everything? I think having my missus, like my missus is quite good. So she lets me do my fishing. She doesn't ever involve, and with work, you know, she lets me do my, obviously she has to let me do my work. She doesn't have a choice, but she understands people that know me know what I'm like. You know, I've got loads of nicknames for being quite obsessive. They think, every, you know, I get took the piss out of a little bit because of that's how I am. What you got? What are your nicknames? A hundred mile an hour. L. <laughs> my missus, my missus calls me turbo. She nicknames me that sometimes because when I start something, I'm, you know, like when I, like, so I did the keto diet a few years ago and I decided I was going to do it in the car I was like, I might do the keto, and I drove straight to Sainsbury's five minutes after deciding it. I went in the shop, I bought all the shit I needed to do, and I went on a keto diet for eight months without just off of a, like a. Like once, she's in the car, and, yeah. she, and she's like, why do you have to do this now? But I do. When I have something in my head, I just do it. Like last night, I was working in the office. I've been making thumbnails all day. Well, not all day, all afternoon. I've been making loads of thumbnails, and I'll be doing by categories for the website. So I started a new category, I did the templates for them. And I had like 36 thumbnails to do. And rather than just start it and fin- I just have to finish it. Do you have to do all 36? I just have to finish it. Yeah, I can't leave something. Like when I'm editing a film, I'll go back out there at eight o'clock at night and finish it because I have, in my head, I like to have it done, boxed off. And I don't care about work. Like it doesn't bother me, but I enjoy doing it. So it's not like. What happens if you can't do it? Is what it is, but you can only try, can't you? So you can leave it. You yeah, can like, leave it to a point. But I don't. Why can't you do it? Like if it's if it's editing, why can't why can't you do it? I suppose you you, you can. Nothing is stopping you, is it? If I have something else to do, I won't do it. But yeah. I'm not a person. I don't go and sit indoors and watch telly. I watch telly when I go to bed. That's when I watch TV. Yeah. I don't watch telly otherwise unless I watch the football. I just like to do that, and whether it's work, fishing, gardening going on a diet or whatever like I'm just very if I'm gonna do something I'm gonna do it and that that runs through everything I do 
every, they run through everything I do. I've got a little bit of OCD. Um, you know, I've got just just off guess, guess I've got a sl- little list of traits that makes me that kind of person. But also those around you sort of know they know, yeah, part, and part that's why you, I like that's why people have always said you know you should never have friends in business, blah blah blah. Um, never work with your friends. I'm the opposite of that. Every single person that I'm involved with photography is one of my friends because one, I like to, I want to give people around me opportunities to be involved in something good if I feel like they've, like yeah. they want to do it. Um, but also they understand me, what I'm like, and it's easier, I think, although it, Kind of, it's harder. It's kind of harder in one way because you have to. You're still working with people that are your friends, but they understand me better as a person. Which I think, if you didn't, and you didn't have that friendship and that kind of that bond that holds you together, then you could. Some people might not want to work with me as much yeah. Yeah. because of the way I am. They understand it more, and I feel like they may be appreciate me more for being that way they know what I'm like and I'm like it they know I'm like it in everything I do so it's not as if you don't know your boss outside of work boss is the wrong term I don't even like to use that word but for example yeah yeah if you someone out there works for a guy who seems really full-on or really fussy really picky really but you don't know what they're like outside of work it might be harder to understand whereas they know I'm like that all the time but also I the do. nature of your work, you walk, you work so close together, mate. Because mm. as you like, you you got to have that understanding and friendship. You you can't not have it. You'd have it anyway, wouldn't mm. you? You can't just clock off. They're long days, no, like, big shoot times. It, it's a lifestyle more than anything. Yeah, and I don't, you know, I don't mind if they, I don't, you know, when they finish work, they finish work. That is what it is. Yeah, but yeah. for me, it's like I think just for them, because they're my friends, they understand. I'd like to think they do anyway. That I'm not like that. You no, know, we joke all the time. I joke with Bridge all the time. You know. We get back from a shoot late and I'm like, should we do an all-nighter tonight working? Just for a joke, you know, because I'd happily go and now we've got this. Stuff. What do you say? He just no. he tells me to fuck off and goes. But <laughs> I like working because I like what I do. Um, and as a person, I like to get I like to get stuck in. I do. Yeah. I like to just, I just, it's how I am. And it's the same with my fishing as it is with my work and it's, or anything else that I do. And if I don't want to do it, I ain't doing it. Poor Gemma, mate. Mm. She has to deal with that absolute mm. madness. We're going. I'm yeah. going full keto now. We're going to Sainsbury's. Yeah. Bless her. You hammer her on that story as well, mate. So yeah, she likes it. <laughs> she hammers me worse, probably. Behind. She don't publicly, mate. Not publicly, no, <laughs> no. But she does. She does. Trust me. <laughs> Play to Gemma and you, mate. It ain't one way traffic. I'll tell you that. <laughs> Um, we've gone ma- a massive tangent into work and we will go back into topography and talk about sort of, sort of highlights, but mm. back to your fishing yep. and this target element for you, the idea of targeting fish. And we talked about that first fish there. How, how do you go and identify what you would deem as a, as a suitable target? I've got my ear to the ground. I would say, mm. obviously a lot of my big part of my life is, um, is fishing a huge part of my life is fishing, so it's never difficult to find a to find a carp. You know, I never find myself scratching for somewhere to to go next. As such, a little bit more recently, I've fished uh, like I like to. I've always quite liked to fish local. Um, I do travel, and I, but I think especially now that I've got a business to run, mm. which I invest a lot of my time in. As I've said, it suits me well to fish in a low, like to fish locally. But I've kind of got to the point now where I've been fishing. Although I have fished a- away from home as well, um, a lot of the lakes around my way I've fished over the years. But that's always just been it's always been like a bit of a progression from one lake to the next, and that lake to the next. And I've done that when I was a kid. I wanted to catch all the car, all the big carp from a certain selection of lakes and yeah. then since that time I've just gone out out and out you know I just is it size based is it looks based is it lineage based it's, it's more just what it meant just for the like when I was a kid it was all about just that area I just became okay. I just when I was it all started I was like right I've caught that one I'm gonna go on that lake and there's quite a lot of lakes close by um and you think right I'll fish them and then once you've finished on them ones then it's like right well 
there's another cluster of lakes that might be three miles away, four miles away. Fish those. Um, and in the area close to my home, I've fished most of the lakes over the last, say, 15 years. Um, some of them now have come back through, but it's more just like I wanted to catch all those carp from those lakes. Uh, they all had a big one in. Every lake's got a big one. And the, the, of the fish that I like to catch, or the fish I liked, sorry, I've set out to catch them. That's just how I've done it. And it's from one lake to the next. It doesn't My life doesn't have to change much to do it because you're only moving, say, 10 minutes down the road. Yeah, or, you're local. Um, but like I say, now I don't have, hence why I'm not fishing in the winter now, hence why I'm still not, I haven't been this winter. Um, I don't have the, I don't have the waters and the fish to make me want to go out and do it without having to travel a long way. And in the winter, because of work, because of what I am, it's, it's, I need places that are close to me really. Yeah. It suits, especially for the winter months in the summer, doesn't matter so much. You know, you can go wherever you want. You've got a long daylight hours you've got. Um, but for me, it's always been about the car has to be nice, preferably big as well. Um, and I've just tried to, especially in the Essex area, I've just tried to go from that lake to that lake to that lake to that lake until I've caught them. But um, you've pretty much done them, haven't you? Mm, yeah. Most, so what's next? Most of them. Um, we talked Oxford, but is I've it got it? a few tickets. I've got oh, I've got a Dinton ticket. I've got, but the f- <sighs> it's a bit weird these days. Like, I don't want to say I've got a different outlook on things. Because I haven't, but at the same time, I have. I I don't really know now. Like I'm not lost in fishing. That's that would be wrong. But to make like I have to dedicate someone like Dinton because it's far away. Yeah, I have to dedicate blocks of time for that. And for me to, to fish Dinton, I'm got to fish there two or three days a week every week, which is fine because now I'm in a position with work where um I can do a lot of my work from the bank. About years ago, I was constantly filming and constantly editing. I'm not now. It's a bit different. You know, I'm more, I spend a lot of time on the phone, on email. Yeah. I can do a lot of it from my computer. I've kind of stepped back from things that are more, you know, like being on the bank all the time filming or being away all the time. So I'd like to, this year I do plan, like I say, I plan to fish in Oxford. I can work from the bank. That's what I plan to do because the last year or so, COVID's fucked things a little bit in terms of, putting things out of joint for me. Mm. Like if I don't go for a little while, I can not go. Can you? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. But when I go, as soon as I go once, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Switch. As soon as I go once, bang. Yeah. And that is what will all, has always been that way. And that's what will happen this year. Like, so what's next? I w- I'm always trying to find places local to have on the back burner. I've got a really good lake on the, like, but I've caught the ones I wanted to catch from there. There's still some nice, really nice carp in there that I want to catch. But that burning desire to be there isn't as strong as it was. So now it's like, I could have fished there all winter, I suppose, but just something in me, just I just haven't. Um, I think it takes me a little bit more for me now to, things have to suit better. They have to, things have to suit my work and my fishing, whereas a long time ago, well, some time ago, Work had to suit my fishing, fishing or yeah. other things had to, whereas now I've got two things in my life that are really important and I've got a family. So mm. if I can only go to Dinton once every three weeks, I ain't going to do it. No. Whereas when it's local, I can do, I'll always find a way to make it work. But I go back to the point I said a minute ago this year and I, probably for the last six months, my, my, not my job role, but my responsibilities and what I have to do day to day have, have changed slightly. I can do it from a laptop, I, you know, and the stuff I can't do from a laptop. I work, I work late when I'm at home to get it done. So this year, my plan is to fish away from home, um, go on a Sunday, do a couple of nights every week, and do my work from the bank. Because once the rods are out, I'm happy to do it. Um, you can do that. You can balance them both. Mm, yeah, because yeah. I do it in the dark, or I'll do I can't it, do it, mate. I'll do it, and if I don't get it done, I'll do it when I get home. You right? Know? Yeah, yeah. I'm not like. <clears throat> I'm not, you know, I've, I did it in the autumn when I was fishing. I end up catching catching fish throughout the days and blow up. Things happen, but 
you know, I still, it will always get done. It's not like, yeah, fair if it's got to be done, too. it will get done whether I have to do it. I've tried. I've taken the old laptop yeah. so many times yeah. fishing and I can't. I just can't. But like I say, a lot of my work now, a lot of the things I do, it's it's coming up with ideas, it's coming up with concepts. Yeah. So it's talking to people on the phone. It's not as, and you can do that from the bank. Yeah. I can do editing, but we've got editors now and stuff. So I can go fishing and I know that I can still do what I do from there. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's not detrimental to... No, to it's not detrimental. Yeah. To, no, it's not detrimental to topography in any way, me doing that. And actually, if you look at anyone else in my position, they're almost... They are at the forefront of everything that they do. And as an angler, mm. um, I have... I should be that... I can do that with topography. You know, my fishing can be just as important to topography as me sitting there editing. Yeah. Um, the problem lies in, you know me not always wanting to make my fishing the forefront of everything I do in terms of filming and whatnot. That's what's hard. You know, if I just fished lakes where I was happy to publicise everything all the time, blah, 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 I could go fishing all the time and it's work in a way. But that's not you though, is it? No, nah, not really, no. Like, you, always- you, you, I mean, we talked about this and we, we talked very flippantly and we'll talk more about sort of specific targets and carp you've caught, but that's very much... Yeah, not your publicised sort of day ticket. I don't know. No. You know what I mean? Those type of waters. No. It's very much something you keep for yourself, mm. isn't it? My fishing is, yeah, has been for... I don't think there's many people in my position in terms of, media, you know, the media side of things that are as... Uh, keep their fishing as close to their chest as I probably do. And although I do film a lot of what I do, it doesn't a lot of it doesn't see the light of day for a long time. mm I don't really know what well, I do. It's largely down to the fact that the lakes I fish have always been quite busy, and you have to kind of be that way. You said to me when we were planning it, you said your, your Instagram, mm. in terms of your imagery that yeah. you're putting up at the moment, yeah. is like a couple of years retrospective, isn't it? Three years, I think. Yeah, three years. Three years. Yeah. So, out, so there you go. Sync, yeah. But that's because of the busy nature and competitiveness of those venues. Yeah, and also I just never really like was never really that, like I got Instagram. I could have a massive Instagram following because I got Instagram. My name on Instagram is Elliot Gray. Try yeah. you try getting your name with no digits or weird ha- or having to put some sort of random fucking code after it, you know, because everyone's taken up, isn't it? Yeah. There'd be t- I probably I bet there's hundred Elliot Grays on there now. Mine's just Elliot Gray. So I had Instagram a, a long time ago, yeah. but I never really used it. I never really. Um, I didn't see the value of it. I do now. Yeah. You know, Instagram following is a massive thing in this day and age. And if I'd have been, if I'd have wanted to or had put my fishing in the spotlight more, my Instagram following, if I'd have tried harder with it, like maybe I do now, it would probably be double the size of my Instagram. Yeah. I believe because I've always fished. I'll catch some nice fish. I'm quite, I'm quite, happy talking on it. I know what the recipe to have a successful Instagram following is, but it's never bothered me really. Um, it does more now because I know that it's the importance of it and doing what I do, it, it is important. You know, if you can't get left behind in that sort of thing, it's no, it's no good really just being tucking yourself away. But I still do with my fishing. Right. But so, when I'm out fishing, if I catch, I never put it on my Instagram story. I'll put all the other stuff I might be doing on there. But even that, I don't really like doing rigs, but I just put random stuff on there. But when you look at someone else's stories, got this fish, that fish, this rig, that, and it's great. And as for someone looking in, it's it's probably more interesting. But for that person doing it, they are probably trying to... Uh, support a life where they're able to go out fishing. Yeah. They're keeping their sponsors happy, blah, blah, blah. And in order to do that, they have to do that. You know, they have, and some of them like doing it, no doubt. I would happily do it if I didn't think it was going to affect my fishing, but it nearly always will. And that the fishing is more important to me than the followers that come with fishing. But I do see the importance of it. And I do my best now to balance things out. Yeah. Because I do want want my Instagram following to grow because it's important for my 
livelihood and my business and things like that. So, but nothing is more important. I do it all the time. I go fishing. I'm like, right, I'll do the story this time. And as soon as I catch one, that's it. My story just dies. I don't put nothing else on there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but like I say, I put my pictures up now from like, but I'm a long way behind. Long way behind. Um, but that whole I, sort of picture, you know, sort of style is very you, isn't it? It's very sort of like, um, I don't know, it's very distinctive. Like, I don't want to label it, but it's like that sort of keep it real, trendy mm. side of the sport. Mm. In the same way that typography is, you're not doing necessarily like your mass day ticket venues or whatever. You're, no. you're doing that sort of top percentage of, of angler, top sort of proper carpy, if you mm. like, anglers. That, that mm. sort of whole fashion look, lifestyle, the, the sort of style of it all, has that always been sort of there? Is that just how you angle, always part of it, or...? I've just always been that way. I think, um, I remember, <laughs> it sounds fucking ridiculous even to say it, but I remember being 15 years old. And that's a long time ago, yeah? Yeah, how old are you now? 31. Yeah. So 16 years ago, I remember yeah. I used to get my dad's old fleeces out the cupboard and all that sort of stuff. There was no Instagram or Facebook back then. I was not trying to be anybody. But I'd like, I'd like, I'd wear his old fleeces, like, because I thought they, like... Bull felt, Terry. I've gone yeah, full just, Terry. I didn't know Terry and was then. Gee. You know, um, I remember like cutting holes in my joggers once when I was because I but I'm so, because I wanted to look and seem like these guys who I was rolling with at the time, yeah, bricklayers, tradesmen, and that's what they look like because they come from work in there. And I was just a 15, 16 year old kid trying to, I guess, in a way, trying to fit in, but I also felt like part of it, yeah. If yeah. it made me feel, you know, it sounds like I say it sounds fucking ridiculous, but I was a kid, um. But I've always, ever since then, you know, I don't cut holes in my trousers anymore, that's for sure. But I've always, I think, had an, had a, but I've had an identity, I suppose. Maybe not so much now. Everyone's, you're a lot more. But if you go back and look at me when I was like 18, 19, I think I was, I've always kind of been that way from a kid up through. I've always liked to have holes in my clothes. I've always felt yeah, comfortable like that. I don't know what that is. I'm, um, I rough it. I'm happy to rough it. And that kind of the holes in your clothes. Like I remember I had a pair of joggers that they were literally filled with fag burns where I used to just, whenever I was sitting, whenever I was doing my rigs, I'd put my fags on it on my lap whilst I'm doing stuff. And they'd just burn holes in my, yeah. yeah, And that wasn't me. I wasn't doing it on purpose, you know, but I didn't look at myself in them clothes and go, Oh, oh, they got holes in. I'm not going to wear them now. Yeah. It's, I didn't, I've never done things to just like, um, to no. look, car- I hate the word carpet. I've never done yeah. things, except for, well, like I say, when I was like, but that wasn't to look carpet, that was to feel like in, one in, of them as yeah, a 15 yeah. year old kid. Um, but I've always tried to have an identity. In fact, I've not tried to, I just, I think I always have to a degree. I've, I don't, I've said this before, I've, I've I, it certainly inspired a little bit by reading um, in pursuit and all that, and you see Terry in his cardigans. Yeah, you know, I bought the Nevilles, I bought the Buzz Bars, and maybe for a period of time, as a 17, 18 year old, that kind of thing influenced me. But then, quite quickly, I just wanted to be me and actually have my own way of doing things. Um, I think that uh, it definitely comes across that way. I think knowing you and being you've been involved in media and seeing you through that for a long time. In no way does it come across contrived. God, if no. I went out with blinking fluorocarbon main lines, some old Daiwa reels and real tight buzz bars, it'd be like, who's he trying to be? Mm. It's just not, it's never come across like no. you're doing it for that. But it's always been interesting that that sort of, that top end, if you like, that real high mm. point of sort of cart fishing with your iconic images, your brilliant photography, you sort of, all that, that's all come quite organically with, with regards to you. It's been part of there's how defi- you've developed. Yeah, I it? think like there's definitely inspiration. Like I say, you look at people, you like I looked at, it sounds close, so cliche because everyone says it, but for so many people that was the case. You looked at Tell and him in his book and it inspired you to want to look that way and be that way. Yeah. But I, it always was in me a bit anyway. You know, I was already... I wasn't quite wearing a little grey cardigan like in his dustbin picture and all that, but I was already wearing my dad's clothes and things with holes in before reading that book. So if someone says to me now, oh, you're just another Terry Owen clone, you can say it, I don't really care. Because I did buy Neville's, I did buy SS3 founders because I like the look of them. But 
I'm never. I'm not a person that is. Um, I don't very rarely look at anyone else and be like, "Oh, I'm going to copy you." Or, I like to have my own identity, even if it's only the slightest things that most people may not even notice. Yeah, but we were a lot of people was inspired to look like him, to want to of fish course. like him. There's no, there's no hiding that. What about the other way around? What about people now looking at you and being influenced by what you do? Whether that be um, the filming side of things, your photography, whether that be your setups, whether that be all that type of stuff. Mm. H- how do you feel about that? I think this is what it is. I think just happens. If some people probably look at me and think, I couldn't think of anyone worse to be like, but there'll be some people that don't feel that way. That's only a, I think that's, that's what it is, isn't it? That's what, that's what happens. If you put, if you're out in, if you're in the limelight, mm. again, there's a bit of a shit term, but if, it's kind of, if that's the simplest way of putting it. Um, but some people will take to you, some people will take a liking, some people will take a disliking. But that's just how it goes, isn't it? It's um, part and parcel. I think the more different you are, the more different you... I think being different, being genuine, yeah. and obviously being... Dif- to be different, normally you have to be genuine because if you're if it's forced, you're probably copying someone else, then you're not genuine and you're not different because you're, you, you're to playing be diff- a part, you can't you? look at yeah. someone else, go, oh, I want to be like them and then be different by doing it because you're not. Yeah. Um, so I think there'll be, there'll be, might be tiny little traits in my personality or things that I do that some people might like other people, but th- at the same time, other people might hate them. If I'm holding my rear landles, loads of people slag you off for that. It's what it is. Like, yeah. Some people do it because you do it. Other people call you a dickhead because you do it. So, yeah, I think, you know, but I think um, it's only natural to have people. Some people will like you, some people won't. And that's, yes. And you're not bothered. It's just not, how it is. I am. I, I always used to say I'm not bothered. If someone doesn't like me, I suppose it does bother me at, that nowadays. Does it? Yeah. Yeah, it does. Yeah. In what it, way? What do you mean? A comment? Do you do you pay much attention to that sort of stuff, or is it is it DMs? Yeah, stuff? I am I a bit know. like yeah. It doesn't bother me. I keep doing this, kind of saying one thing than another. It doesn't bother me because that person probably doesn't bear any relevance in your life. Certain yeah. people bothers me a lot more, or would bother me a lot more. Go on, but what you can't you mean? please. No, you can't please everybody. If someone I respect doesn't like me or thinks I'm an idiot, that would bother me. If a random guy says something about me, I've had it loads of times. Damn, I don't really care. I'd rather he didn't, because I would rather everyone liked me, but I know that I'm not that kind of person. I don't think anybody can like, you can't have no, anybody no. who everybody and likes. I, most, I think if you're a person that everybody likes, you're probably, without being out of order, you're probably a bit boring, or a bit bland, because there's nothing about you to dislike, and there's probably nothing about you to really like. Or people don't know you. No, I think a lot of big characters, yeah. you're going to have people that like you, people that don't. Um, I bet the most famous people in the world, there's loads of people that hate them as well. Yeah. And the people that everyone, there'll be very, very few that everyone seems to have the same opinion on, but they're probably quite, it's probably not a lot to dislike. Mm. And in turn, it's probably not a lot to like. And you just have an opinion. You're like, oh yeah, he's all right. I don't, I'm not a, yeah, he's all right kind of person. I'm probably too much for people or, someone really likes me because I have a personality, I suppose, that you'll go one or two ways with. I always feel like you don't, I mean, fishing's a very different industry anyway, as opposed to a lot of different, there's a lot of other industries, but I always feel you're one person and you said it pretty early on where you know your mind and you sort of speak it. There's Mm. not really, I don't see any genuine's a great way of putting it. You are exactly that, mate. I don't think there's anything else in there. Do you know what I mean? If there's something that you don't like, you'll say it. I've tried, I've learned. vice versa. I've learned to be less that way, like in terms of saying it. Right. <laughs> because I've got, you know, I've got myself in a bit of trouble in the past, but I still have my moments. But yeah, if I am like that, I won't pretend. No. I'd rather just not comment on it these days than, yeah. than comment on it and say something I don't actually mean, if you know what I mean. Okay. If that makes sense. It's easier. It's easy to upset people. I'm I'm a person that will say things in a way that can be quite like blunt or I, I'll jazz it up a little bit to make it 
I'll be a bit more aggressive in what I say. But I don't really mean it in that way. And anyone who knows me will will know that when I say something, you know, yeah, I don't mean it as, as like aggressively as I'm saying it. But someone who doesn't know me, they'll take it literal. Yeah. People, you know, some people are literal and they're like, and that can, you know, that can make people, um, not, you know, I think that can make people dislike you. So I'll say things to my friends now, people close to me that I wouldn't say on the internet. Or, whereas years ago, I'd have said it on the internet yeah, as well. Yeah, you care. And then you well, upset That's part people. of the process though, isn't it, mate? Mature, isn't it? Yeah, I've grown up, mate, and I've learned. Um, you know, I've represented the biggest company in fishing for 10 years. Mm. And along that road, there were wobbles and things I did, said, ways I acted, but those things, I was, you know, I was young. When and you look now, back at it, you cringe or not? No, no, I don't. No, I don't. Not at all. No, don't cringe. Um, it is what it is. That is how I was. That is who I was then. It's kind of who I am now. I can't imagine you, you know. reacting much to a rollicking either. No, like, I, no, I do. I do. Do actually. you? Yeah. Because it, like... If it's so like in quarter when I used to get grief for saying I'd done wrong, it, but it, I didn't want to. I didn't want to risk losing your job. Yeah, or like losing yeah. that involvement. And so you know, if if a parking warden had a go at me, I wouldn't care. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. Okay. But I get it, you. If my dad had a go at me, I would care. If yeah. a random guy on the street, I wouldn't care so much. So, but I don't. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not a. I'm not a. I don't give a fuck kind of person. That's that isn't me at all. Um, but I, you know, I, I care when it when it means when the person or the situation yeah. means something to me. Yeah, a lot more in those situations. Yeah. Right, back to targeting fish, mate. I take yeah. you down another wormhole. <laughs> Sorry, mate. Yeah. Um, in terms of we talked about the targets you select, so yeah. we talked about not necessarily just being the weight of the fish, but around the locality of those lakes and, and how that's now progressed into sort of having to go further afield. Mm. Targeting fish, mm. talk me through how you target a specific fish on a venue. You can give me examples, yeah, of course, but what's yeah. the thought process that goes through your so, head? So uh, well, it was always, you know, I spend a lot of time, homework is really important if you want to target a carp. I can't remember, I watched something called Red, or heard someone say something the other day, I can't remember what it is, but basically if you want to, it was a, we interviewed Simon Crow. That's it. Oh, crap. And he said, yeah, and he said, if you want to target a fish, you have to know the fish. Yeah. Well, there you go. That's like always been the first thing. Some carp get caught from the same areas all the time. That carp I caught in the autumn I was talking about, it always gets caught from that swim. And I, and I knew that through, you know, if ever I see a picture of it, you try and work out where the background is, you talk to people, you find out. They are creatures of habit. Some carp don't. Some carp are random. Yeah. They get caught all over the lake. That's is just as important as knowing whether they get caught from a certain area. Um, and the first, it's probably the most, the, it's probably the easiest thing to learn is where the captures of that fish come from. That's like, that's your step one. Once you've chosen the lake, once you've chosen the carp you want to catch, where does it get caught from the most? Some lakes there's an obvious pattern, others there isn't. Mm. Um, and you've got two ways. I remember once I fished a lake, and I just relentlessly fished the swim it got caught from. Did not get caught much, this carp, once a year. And I just relentlessly fished in there because I thought, well, if I historically it always comes yeah. from here pretty much. Obviously, there's always going to be the odd capture, but I fished in that swim relentlessly and I did catch it from there quite quickly as well. But if I'd have fished around the lake following the fish all the time, I wouldn't have caught it quickly. And I put, and I, maybe I would have caught it from there down the line, I don't know, but at the time it was like, right, I'm fishing in here because this is where I think it will get caught from. Historically it does, and it did. That is where I caught it from. Other fish I've fished for, it's not always that easy. You just you do have to do the numbers game sometimes. Mm. You can't just go to a lake and, you know, there's a lot more now. I think people look into moon phases, moon, certain fish get caught in certain moon phases, all that sort of stuff, certain weather um, and certain swims. There's, you can go into it in probably as much detail as you see fit. You're willing to, you're willing to go into it. But the upshot of it is, though, if you're you would rather sit in a swim, sacrifice bites for the chance of the next bite being the fish you want. More, I was more in. I, I was more capable of doing that years ago. Mm. I will do it now. 
if I'm if I'm that sure, you know, if I'm that sure, then yeah. Um, but uh, these days, I'm a lot more um, interested in what is going on around the lake. Okay. In terms of because that fish ain't always there. Do you know what I'm saying? So, yes, you can sit there in the same in the swim all the time, and you're going to do an element of rotting, of, like in mm. that swim, if if that's how you want to do it. So. I think being aware of having that one track mind, but also being aware of what is going on because there will be days where the fish is up the other end of the lake. And if you're just going, I'm just going to sit here, you know, you might catch down the other end mm. if you go down there and find it. And so I think trying to comp, trying to um, combine the two, should we say, concentrating on an area like that, but also being aware that they have fins and they do swim around and go to other places. So I think you, you can go about it two ways. There's so many different ways I think of do, of doing it. It kind yeah. of it just pans out how it pans out sometimes. But yeah, you can just sit in a swim, that, well, and you probably catch it in the end. But as, yeah. for me, also, it's like right. Well, I don't want to catch it in the end. I want to catch it as soon as possible. Always. So you wouldn't mind going on a venue first bite that. Fish, if I could choose, that, I'd be that way every time I went. Right. No, maybe not just catching it first bite because it'd be a bit boring. But I'm not normally there to catch the others. So the quicker you catch it, the better it is. You catch others along the way. That's great, but, but if, the, if that fish died, I'm fishing for. I would pull straight off the lake. So right, the quicker you get it done, the better. I think if you're fishing for one carp, the quicker you can catch it, the better because you then go on to the next one. You know that's if you want to catch one fish. What wish would you like to be your first bite? Obviously that one. Yeah, 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 I think. But luckily, it doesn't pan out that way very often. There's very few anglers that just keep catching the big and straight away every time. So. Yeah, I think um, ideally that would happen, but it, it never will. It will never happen that way. No. You always catch a few first. Of course you do. Um, but yeah, I think you've got to be aware. You've got to be aware of what that fish does historically. You've got to look for the patterns, do what you can with that information, but then also stay aware of what is happening around you. So there is than just sitting in a swim. Exactly. There's not just a longing it out, sort no. of rotting, as you said. I like that apt <laughs> term. Um, Observation wise, I mean, I've seen over a lot of your footage and the stuff that you filmed. Mm. Observation sort of key for you. Is it? Do you do you want to get a visual on that fish as much as possible, or are you happy? I don't know. Maybe never seeing it and it just turning up on a bite, or or what? I, what ideally, sort of you, you want to see to? it, don't you? Like you, you want to see it. I've 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 had some campaigns where you don't never see that one. I've yeah. had it where you just for some reason you see all the others and you don't see that one. Weird happens. Um, the more you see it, though, I think the you know, the the better, the greater the chance. Of, the more you see it, the more you know what it's doing. And if you know, the more you know about it, it's all, it's all well and good knowing his, like past stuff, but knowing what it's doing there and then is more important than that, probably. So, yeah, you like you like to see them as much as you can. But there's also something nice about not always seeing them. Yeah, you, you know, yeah, a bit of mystery. Just constantly staring at the thing every single day. Yeah, it's nice sometimes. You think, oh my god, there it is. Have you had them where you've seen them and you, you're on them and they're just not that you've just not like been frustrated? They've been sitting in a snag. I've or seen fish that like I remember one fish. It would always sit in the same snag mm. all the time, but I knew I knew I wasn't going to catch it there. Yeah. It would sit there every day. I could well not every day, but re- you know, it'd sit there a lot, and you could go and look at it, and I would go and look at it, but it sat up in the water in the branches. And then um, it would leave the branches as it got dark. So this is all it's doing is going there to sit and chill. Yeah, it's not dropping down ten foot to the bottom of the snags. It's and I caught it basically. Then I caught it on its way down to the snag along the margin further up. Um, so yeah, but we're not. I think especially now, and especially on busy lakes, you're not blessed with being able to just see them all the time. No, nah, definitely. There's always not. someone fishing in the way you can't look in that snag because he's fishing it or you can't. And also they spend a lot of time out in the lake and you can't really see him out there no, unless you've got you the trees to see them. But yeah, it's targeting a carp. How do you put it on paper? I guess you can't. You just need to know as much as you can and be as. There's also quite like, a lot of like instinctual 100%, calls that you make. Massively. That, that you can't More than really, anything, I think, probably. Well, you can't really explain that. Say you took somebody to Troyal and said, look, you want to catch this mm. fish from this lake. All right, it comes out in this swim early spring. It comes out in this swim in the autumn. But in between that time, there'll be days where you think, oh, 
I know it's a cold wind, but I'm going to get on the end of it. You might catch it from there. There's yeah. a lot of that involved, mm. isn't there? I think the weirdest thing over the years is the amount of times I've sat there and thought I'm going to catch one and then had. That's weird. That I know. I remember weird. Damo saying about it, and I know a few people that say it, and it does seem a little bit like people are probably talking shit, but I've had it a few times over the years, quite a few times, where you just like, you sit there and all of a sudden you just have this overwhelming, oh, and I mean overwhelming confidence and assur- like almost. What, so you, you, you just not know the start of the session? Yeah, you just know it's you know, just sometimes I've just sat there and I'm like, I'm, I'm catching this and I've said it to people and then I have. Like, and I know, like I said, I remember Damo saying it on, um, Damon Clark saying it on one of his podcasts and a few people have said it, but you just get this weird, like, what the fuck is that about? Where does that come from? You know, because it's not every day. I'm talking like a, you can't force yourself to feel that way, but you just do. You sit there and you just, I'm going to, and then, and then you do. What you fish know? has happened? What, can you remember the fish? I've had it with, I had it with a fish called single scale. I've had it with, um, I had this one from um, the lake I was talking when I said I fished in that swim for a long time. Yeah. Had it there. That fish? Yeah, the fish. Just sitting there just thinking, it's, I'm going to get the bite, I'm going to get the bite, I'm going to get the bite, and then you do. Or the night before sitting there thinking, I'm going to, this is going to happen, and it does. Um, yeah, I've had it over the years. Like, And they're not like boshing over you. No, 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 no. Just a weird, like, just a weird, I've had it several times. I can't even... Now you're asking me to like name the fish. I can't. Yeah, sorry. I've name them the all. But I've I'd had I've had that handful of times with big carp where you just and like I say, you tell your friends like it's happening. You just know it's happening. You can't sleep. You can't like. And yeah. I, I think it's largely a build up. But there's also times where it's not. Nothing's really different about that session. You're just there, and you just think I'm gonna catch it. I'm, and then you do, and it's pretty weird that. Yeah, that is. You don't feel like it very often. Um. Yeah, I remember. I remember it happening vividly, as you can imagine, because it's a feeling that doesn't come very often and shouldn't come ever. That yeah. sort of level of that a, sure is death. That happening. sure, you know. Um. But yeah, what the fuck's that all about? Um. <laughs> but Take I, it. I guess it's just being so in tune, being. Yeah, and it has yeah, and it's happened. It. And there's not many times, not many times when I've felt like that, and there's certainly not many times where I've felt like that, and then it doesn't happen. You get times you think, oh, this is good for it. But I've had weird things over the years where you just you you just call it, and it does happen, which is odd. But I've heard other people say the same. Nice. Can't say yeah. something to me, Mystic mate. med kind of shit. Yeah, yeah. take that. Um, but other times they just come along when they come along, yeah, out of the blue, of you know. Approach-wise, for you, spot-wise, leading, all these aspects of sort of, mm. uh, you, you've done it for a period of time. We talked there about a 16-year period, but you were angling before that, of 30, when you were 13. Mm. Um, there's been a period of time where you've sort of refined your angling. You've also, mm. no doubt, been influenced by some of the mega anglers that you've been out with. But but you're, you've been sort of consistently successful in targeting these bigger fish. Every venue is different. Every fish is different. I know that. And we talked about analysing the habits of the fish, where they come out from. But for you, how how would you go about finding a spot, for instance? Or do you not bother finding a spot? Do you go straight in with chods? How how generally, and I know it's hard to generalise, mm. would you go about in that targeting process of, of whichever carp it is you're trying to catch? I'm not an opportunist angler, I wouldn't say. Okay. I can fish that way and I have done. I don't like to fish that way. Um... I'm more about, I often, these days, years ago I would have said I was. Hinge fishing, chod fishing became quite a thing. Yeah. You spend a lot of time running around, but I'd always end up going back to fishing with those sort of same sort of rigs in a more static kind of way. My fishing, when I look back over the last, say, 10 years or so, nearly always boils down to one swim. Not but not for like a year. I would never find myself sat in these swims for long periods of time. It gets to a point where I find an area, a spot, whether it's in close or out in the lake, and all of my concentrate. This goes back to what I'm saying. I've said earlier on about how I am as a person. Mm. Once I when once I decided, or once I find something to home in on, I'm. It suits me and my brain far better to go home from the lake constantly thinking about just that one 
obviously I'm like I say, I'm always aware of what's going on around me. But when I feel like I know something good is going to happen in an area, I like having just that one thing to think about. And it sounds, it could easily sound like I'm going to miss everything that's going on around the lake, but that's not the case. Like, when I fish in that way, I will generally always be catching more than the people around me, and I'm because I'm aware of what's being caught. I'm putting so much time and effort into that one spot, but I'm taking into account everything else. How do they get there? Where do they come from? Times of day, blah blah blah. Line lay, presentation, baiting, pre-baiting. I think when you can, if you have an area that you know that a lot of fish or, or in particular certain fish are visiting. In my head, it's far, I feel like that my strength is making the very most of what that spot is. And it might only be for a four week, like four week window and then it becomes a different spot. Yeah. But it's not often I turn up to the lake, certainly once I've started to fish somewhere and I don't know where I want to be. And how do you identify that? <coughs> we talked about where fish come from. By catching normally. Right. So... You know, you go to the lake, you see what's what, you make decisions based on what you see, like you see what's going on out in the lake. Where are the, so it's always where are the, where are the carp? Do you yeah. know what I mean? Or where's not, where are the fish? And once, but once you have an idea of the areas they use a lot, a passing points, you know, then it, then it becomes about, you have the fish traffic there. You just have to find the spot that you're going to catch those fish from. And I think, a spot that gets passed regularly by a lot of carp, if you if it's a you know that's always a great starting point mm. because you've always got the traffic and without the traffic, your opportunities are far less. <coughs> so you've got traffic, you may or may not obviously have previous with whatever fish it is yep. in that area. The spot itself, I've, you- yeah. So I've always been quite obsessive. <laughs> Goes back. <laughs> been really obsessive with my lead work and I learned this as a kid the weed I, let's right let's break it down in the spring I'm less worried I just fish wherever the fish are I yeah. fish with zigs I fish with chods hinges whatever that's how it suits and I fish in the edge because in the spring they're up in the water shallows yeah, yeah. so I fish with them for zigs they're in the edges because yeah. it's warm I fish on the deck if I'm in the edge or they're just showing in areas moving all around the lake Look, starting to visit areas again they haven't done Generally bright hook baits. Yeah, that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. The classic. That's only for me a small window of opportunity though. Middle of March through till sort of middle of April and then we, as we get into May, I'm more back to the sort of spot fishing side of things again. And <coughs> whether it's whether it's in the edge or out in the lake, um, I like to focus on one area. So typically May sort of time, any any time between May and the winter, it will be an edge spot or out in the lake. Quite often, an edge spot. I like to see. I like to. I like to fish in the edge. I do it a lot. When the weed comes up, things like that, fish more out in the lake. I don't so much like to fish just a big barren area out in the middle of the lake. Mm. If you have to, you have to. But I, it's always based on where the where I'm sitting the fish. If I can obviously see the target fish, great. That helps. But Throughout the summer months, when the weed's up, I learned as a kid that there's always a spot. And the amount of times I've fished areas where people have gone, people won't even be fishing the swim because it's too weedy. Yeah. There's like that to, as soon as those words are said, or as soon as I notice, I know for certain there will be a spot. Sometimes it can take hours and hours and hours with a lead rod, but there's always a spot. And I've learned that. And that spot will always be always come good from what I've in my own experiences harder the spot is to find the weed of the area is the less chance of other people jumping on it (coughs) sorry mate my throat's drying up Um, less chance of other people jumping on it and angling pressure is a big thing so so you're not going to go to this swim and fish the spot at 18 wraps not really you're going to look for a smaller yeah Maybe a spot within the weed yeah. that people aren't looking for. Don't get me wrong. Like I said earlier, you know, if there's a, if sometimes there is a spot on air that does fish, mm. in which case, if if I fish the same spot as everyone else, I try to fish it better than them and do things differently. Okay. Some lakes you have to fish the same as like the same areas as other people because they are 
But then it's all about doing it differently to everybody else. So, yes, you're fishing the same spot, but you're not doing what everyone else is doing. Talk to me more That's about that. Thing. Like I say, the bait I use, line lay, the rigs, you know, the, the placement of the spot. Like, it's easy just to pick a gravel spot, pop a float up on it, cast to it, but the edges of the spots, using a different bait. On a lake that's busy, it can be something as simple as just the bait you use. Yeah. That makes a massive difference. Being different is important, I think. Really important on a busy lake. And I've always, for for a long time, tried to do things. Give me... I'm taking you to Linear. I'm taking you to St. John's. <coughs> um, actually, I'll take you to like B1 or B2, which you probably may not may not fish. But it's it's pretty similar in terms of a lot of lads are fishing similar ranges. Yeah, I think something really like that is probably like just fish tighter and further. Probably Tight, that's longer. In, probably that simple on their yeah, base like that. Yeah. But on a small club water or a small syndicate where everyone's on top of those fish all the time, they're constantly getting badgered Hallowed, by yeah, anglers. Yeah. I put a, a lot of I put a lot of effort into line lay, just raking a swim, mate. People you don't, don't see people. Nah, doing it. it's such a like the amount of people I see. I would never if I'm fishing a spot. There's no way I'm not raking it. Mm. No way I'm not like if there's weed between me and the spot, it's getting raked. Hundred percent, it's getting raked, and I'm raking it from the spot back to my rod tips. Yeah. No one people don't. No do one that. goes that effort. And no. not only does that get your line out of out of sight in terms of fish that are passing over the weed. But when you go from the weed onto the spot, especially when you're fishing small spots, which is what I would prefer to do, you've got, you, you take out that angle from mm, the drop. The, yeah. The, as it yeah. drops down onto the spot. It's, that is a massive thing. Um, on a busy lake where they are hundred percent aware of lines, simple thing, but just by doing that, you'll catch more than the next guy fishing that spot. I'm certain of that. Obviously once you rake it, you've done it for everybody else. That's a different story. But if you can find a spot in a really weedy swim that people didn't think was there, chances of them landing on it are really slim because they're not going to spend the hours doing the lead work. And then you rake a tiny channel back, a thin channel. They've got to land on the spot first thing and then they've got to sink their line on the right line as well to get yeah. the line down through that channel. So you're, you, although you've raked it and it's going to benefit other anglers should they land on the spot, it's not as, you know, you've still got your, your back still kind of covered by the spot that you've chosen. Um, but yeah, like if I'm fishing the same areas as everybody else, I'll try to use a totally different bait. I might use tiger nuts instead of boilies. Might use maggots instead of boilies. Might use boilies instead of maggots. It depends what everyone else is doing. How do you keep, like, how do you keep something like that quiet on a busy club water? Just do it. I just bait, I just bait up in the dark sometimes. Bait up on dark, bait up first light. It must be hard because people are going to know who you are. They're mm. going to know that you're on a club yeah. water. They're going to know that you catch good fish and you're a good angler. So, I mean, not that every angler will, but if somebody's got something going and they're catching yeah. and they know that they're catching from that swim, you can't tempt when your bites are if they're in the middle of the day and there's people Yeah, that watching. is what it is then, like I say. But then, I, like, nine times out of ten, if I'm catching, it's not, I'm probably doing something different to what other people are doing. So it doesn't matter too much. I always try to keep everything count to myself. Yeah. But if they see you, they're going to see you. That is what it is. You, sometimes there's nothing you can do about that. That That's the problem you come to, or something you come to when you, you cross that bridge when you come to yeah. it. But I just try to do everything I can. Like I say, I will bait up in the dark. I bait up. A lot of the time these days, I try to leave my rods out all day I used to always recast something I've sort of stopped doing so I might redo my rods last last light on a Monday night or whatever and then I redo them again on last light on Tuesday night okay. depends when the bites are coming obviously if yeah, they're yeah. coming through the night I might do them first thing in the morning so that it's settled all day and then and as the bites come it's had 12 hours of quiet that's quite important um but I don't like doing my rods at three o'clock and all that when people are, I try to not do that these days when people are walking around or stuff like that. Mm. So, you know, you just do what you've got to do to. That's also an awareness. And hide what you're doing. It's That's, just, yeah, it's nothing, it's nothing, it's nothing like. No, it's not secret squirrel or whatever. Science. No, but you're just doing things. you got to protect what in, you're doing. Yeah. yeah. Um, and if you don't want people to see, do what you can not to see. Wait for them 
make sure yeah. you're not doing it when someone's there. If so, I always have my bucket lid next to my bucket. I put my lid on my bucket if someone comes around. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. It's only, it's only little things like that. But on a busy lake, yeah, it is important because they can always see the spot you're fishing mm. or how far out you're fishing. That's an, But it's how you're doing it. The other things that you're doing that are can become really important. Like when I fish the edge, when I fish in the edges, one thing I put quite a lot of emphasis on is I do a lot of backleading, backled up the shelves, along the shelves, and then to my spot. So if I can, I'll wash in line. But a yeah, lot of places, yeah, like a, a lot line. of places, you can't use them, um, and some spots don't suit it. But if I can wash in line, I will wash in line because I like the idea of the of the line going up the shelf rather than back Straight out into the lake. Yeah. So sometimes you can't do that. Spot doesn't suit it, but quite often if I fish in the edge, I backled up the margin, okay, along the margin, and then back to my spot. So the rig, the rig's on the shelf, the line comes up the shelf, along the top of the shelf, then back down the shelf to the spot with maybe like a rod length or a bit further if it's safe enough to have that much. So you actually end up with like a big almost like a big L shape in your line. Yeah. yeah. But you're lo- but what that means is that if the fish do come across the line, it's not going to the spot. It's, it's running. Away. Yeah. Well, it, yeah. It's several, it's a couple of odd lengths down the margin. Yeah. They see the line. And then when they come across the rig and that further, you know, just little things like that. Like it's the effort there though, isn't it? Mm, just to just, do that. Just something different. Like yeah. sometimes you can't do that because you have to weigh up the, sp- you have to look at the spot, look at what you're dealing with in terms of snags and, you have to weigh it up then, but I just always do everything I can to hide what I'm doing from fish and from anglers. Because mm. who are you? Who are you fishing against? That that's the you're element. Fishing against anglers and you're fishing yeah. against fish. So that, that's the element, especially nowadays, and especially when you're talking about busy club waters. The element is is not necessarily catching the fish because if it was all by textbook and you were you could see the fish and you could move mm. around and you could get anywhere and you could do what you want. Nine times out of ten, we'd all do it, but you have got to consider other anglers that are trying to catch the same fish and the compet- the competitive element around all that as well, yeah, mate. Hundred percent. That 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 I think is a is a big factor. And like you're saying there, some people won't. They'll no, sort of fish. They definitely don't because yeah. I fish around people like it all the time. But I just I like doing it as well. That's yeah. What I'm it's a, it, for me, it's fun. Like. That's why I like edge fishing so much because I can see the spot. I can see the way the fish come in from the spot, which where do they come from? Then I can plan everything around what I'm like. I have it there in front of me to look at. It's like there's the jigsaw puzzle. You just got to put the pieces together. That's what I. That's why I like edge fishing so much because nothing's left to chance. Mm. Like quite often it gets to the point I just think if a carp comes into that snag or that spot, I'm hundred percent going to catch it. Because I know my line lays good. I know I've primed it. I know it's baited. I know what time they visit it. And I've fished on some lakes where you fish different spots, different times a day because there's little windows of opportunity. And then you've got like two or three spots to work with. What's the best way to get a line to that one and to that one? And Mm. as you fish them more, you fish them better. And the same is throughout in the lake. If you're fishing a spot at 80 yards one week and then the other week you're up on another spot, when you go back to fish that one at eight, the first one you fished at 80 yards, two or three weeks down the line, you, do, you fish it with the same efficiency you did the first time. If you fish that spot week in, week out. Yeah. You'll be. Like, when I, when I get to the point, when I'm a few trips in, every single one of my spoms is perfect. My rigs go out one or two casts. The only time they're not, if, and if they're not going out, it's because I wasn't quite happy with the drop. Or But you refine everything to a point where, you put 11 spoms of bait out with pinpoint accuracy in 11 casts mm. and then your rig goes out with one or two casts. Whereas when you just fish randomly around the lake, you've got to do loads of lead work every time. Or certainly I feel like I do. I have to explore the swim. I try to fish nowadays. You have to get the areas right because no good fishing really well to a spot that isn't getting visited. That's, it, that's instinctive and that is... Um, based on observation, but once you've chosen, once I've chosen a spot, whether it's in the edge or out in the lake, it then becomes, then I obsess over that spot about knowing I can't get it out of my head. I go down to bait up. I I fish it. You know, I don't actually do long periods of baiting when I'm not fishing. I normally bait between my trips. 
Okay. I was talking to my mate Luke about this the other day. He's kind of the same. You can't really do it on the lakeside fish. You can't bait a spot for four weeks, five weeks, really. Yeah. You no. can. <clears throat> but when there's a lot of anglers about, you know what I mean? You, so you've got to learn to fish them, fish them, bait them, but not overfish them. Mm. You know, so you, it's kind of a, quite a hard balance to, but yeah, don't, don't fish it too, don't fish it too much. Don't scare them off before it's got good, but also maximise the opportunities whilst you have it because it's n- normally it's quite short lived. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. When when you talk about that and you talk about baiting, mm. for you baiting and fishing, what what I mean, it's different because of stock. It's different, but for you in between trips, generally, what 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 are you actually baiting with regards to quantities on a spot? <laughs> Depends. Like when I fish a North Met. I was baiting with, so I'd, when I'd fish there, I'd fish over the bait I was putting out and I'd come back the next day and put like 40 or 50 kilo particle out. Right. With a spawn. Other lakes I've fished, I've only put three handfuls on it, but I do it every day. Depends how far the way the lake is. If you can't get there regularly, I'd probably put a bit more in. Yeah, big hit. But the more you put in, the, the bigger the spots get quicker. And then for you, and then and other is... anglers find them easier, or fish start fizzing, showing. So it's actually you. You have to. That is all just. You know, you just have to kind of weigh that up at the time. Yeah. When I was on the Met, I had a swim rocking in there, and I kind of knew that no one was really down there. It was getting neglected, so I wasn't so worried. And I tr- I tried to make sure that I put it out as tight as I can, and that's how I fish nowadays. I fish as accurately as possible. Um. Because I don't think people people do it. Like, if I have a spawn go off three, four foot off to the side, that really infuriates me. You know, I want them all. If I could land them all on the same spot, I would. That's how I like to fish. Because, especially when you're putting bits and pieces out, that spreads out a lot more than you think. Yeah. Like, if you bait a bivy size area, as in your spawns are landing but yes, on a bivy patch, that's a lot bigger patch of bait than a bivy. Yeah especially once they start feeding. If you put it all on an unhooky mat, you're probably still going to end up... When they trash a spot, it'll be everywhere. It's still going everywhere. Yeah, yeah. So, like, I was... And I've, I've definitely found in recent years, like, I get bites quickly because I fish so accurate. I hook my bait and stuff when I really... So I know everything's like... Yeah. And when you, if you've got two rods on a spot the size of a mat and all your bait's on the mat, like, if you put one spot off to the right that's full of particle that you could have fish feeding on that for hours mm, really those are little bits without yeah. no rigs there if you don't put any wrong or you at least do your very best not to put any wrong and all the spawns are where your rigs are when them fish turn up they are not feeding for very long without without you getting a bite mm. especially if you've got two rigs on the spot right those are little things that I have tried over the years to hone in on didn't used to fish that way. Like I've become much more of um, I fish really tight, and I fish really accurate, as, ac- as accurate and as tight as I can. A few bombs going off, you catch them and just yeah, I rip them out the sky. I just rip yeah. them out the sky. If they're not, they don't look like they're going to go perfect. I just take them out the sky. Yeah, and obviously having bait short isn't ideal. No, but you'd rather that than be four foot. But I'd rather, yeah, spot. I would rather that because a lot of the time, it's but your bait, you're fishing like where you you in your head you feel like the fish are going to be eating yeah. so the ones that land short are kind of in a dead zone if you know what I mean they get eaten I'm sure they do of course do. they do yeah yeah um, but they're I'm, not as detrimental no I'd rather they shorter. were I'd rather they were 50 yards short of the spot than a rod length what about the classic and you must get it I think everybody gets the same question is deeper waters mm. where your your leads are landing in relation to where you're baiting and yeah. how you personally marry that up third a Further third. the depth, yeah. So it's nine foot deep, I fish three foot short. Mm. With okay. a spawn. Fair. You also, seen that underwater? You had a look at it? No, nah, but I've, like I say, I've, I've tested it with marker floats. Yeah. And I'm very careful with where I put my rod tip and stuff. It's no yeah. good having, like, your spawn always landing flat forward and your, and your rod landing up here. Yeah. It's a massive difference. So I quite often fish down, like, with the spawns and the rods, I try to... I use braid as well, which makes a big difference. Yeah, braided reel lines, don't you? Um, but yeah, I found with feeling a lead down, if you feel the lead down to the side, sort of like a, not quite a right angle, don't know what the degrees would be, but sort of down to my side and out a little bit, 
when I'm feeling my lines down, so my as my, with my rigs, yeah, the the lines on the surface going down takes out a lot of the bow. Obviously, that with a spom rod sort of here, if you actually let the spom land and lay it to the side, you're just the same. Yeah. So I don't land when I land my spoms. My rods in a certain place. Although when I put my rigs out with the rods, it's in a different place. When you actually marry the two up, yeah, they go. They fall into the same place. And like I say, I've tested it with um, floats. Yeah, I put my rigs out sometimes with a spawn. You, you can soon, you know, and you hook yeah. in your bait. You hook in your bait on the retrieve. I can tell by the bites I get that that's about right. Never been out there and checked it. Wind makes a difference. Big bow in the line. I'll add a bit on with the spawn stuff like that. There's no. Um, Heart, you know, certain rule, <clears throat> but anything over six foot. If it's six foot, I just stick to the same. Yeah, if it's six foot yeah. deep. I fish my spawn and my rig at the same. But as you say, there it's consistent. You're using braided um, main lines for your reel, like you know the score of your setup. If you change those variables and you start going to mono and different elements, it all throws it out. And you need to be able to yeah. allow for that. Yeah, so yeah, depth cool. and that. But yeah, a third is like a general, general rule. What I would use. Um, and if anything, I'd rather my bait was beyond me, not short of me. Yeah, of definitely. Bait wise, particle. I use all oily. sorts, mate. It just again, just depends what people are. I What's do you... find myself these days not using. I don't really fish with boilies like straight yeah. boilies that often. Just use all sorts of stuff. I use boilies, but I don't. I I don't spawn boilies because of the way I fish now. Spawning pure boilies doesn't really feel right. Yeah. Um. I have done. Sometimes I do, but generally I use bit. I use bits and pieces. You know? Yeah, but I use everything. I use pellet, corn, wheat, maggots, you know, anything. I use all sorts of different stuff. Depends on what fish are in the lake. I love using straight tigers. That's not something I don't think people do. Yeah, um, I've done really well over the years fishing with big amounts of pure tigers. What's big amounts? Because everyone classically says Fift, uh, you only need fifteen, fifteen, twenty key straight in. I've done it several wow. times. Where have you had success with that? A few places. I've done it. I did it. Um, I used to fish a club water, and I did really well on it there. I've had it on a few lakes, mate. To be fair, I used to fish a club water. Actually, I shouldn't say that because <laughs> you weren't allowed to use them on there. Actually, no, you were allowed, and then they banned them. Yeah, they did. Oh, you were allowed to start with, but then they banned them. But yeah, anyway, on this club water. Um, I did really well. I've done it on a lot of places. I did it at Sandhurst. They actually banned them at Sandhurst after I did it. Did they? Yeah, because a lot of people started doing it. And You've put a few good ones at Sandhurst. You fished a bit yeah, on there, No, I've you? only fished it a handful of times, but... You did it for a sip, didn't you, with Dove? Yeah, yeah. So I tell you what, so um, I did it then. That was pure Tigers. Yeah. And caught a lot. I had the big one from there then. That's right. Yeah, that's right. I remember uh, that. that. same year I did it at Christchurch. These are very busy lakes, yeah? So yeah. they're the day tickets that get fished all the time. So I did it at Sanders, and I knew that no one would have done that over there. So I did it at Sanders, had a really good trip, had the, had the big one there, and then I did it on my stag do at Christchurch. And again, I was like, I bet no one's done this because it isn't done. Yeah. And I don't, you know, as much as I don't advise everyone starts doing it, I'm, I know that it's not bad for me as long as you, it's no different to them eating particles, as long no, as they're it's, prepared, right? It's yeah. literally no different. As long right. as they're prepared, right, as you yeah. say. They just eat them, shit them out. Same as to do any particle. It doesn't do them much good in terms of... Nutritional value. You wouldn't yeah. want to feed them on tigers a whole life. They'd be in trouble. But it's not bad for them. People make out like you can't fish with them in large quantities. You definitely can. Uh, but I did it at Christchurch and I had, I had Scar the big and then. Yeah. So that was two really, really busy lakes, day ticket lakes. And I fished with big quantities of tigers, which was probably something totally different. And in a month or so apart, I had the big one from Sanders and from Christchurch doing that. No, nice. just fishing super tight with something totally different. And I think on a lake like that, the more a lake gets fished, the more those little differences. Probably fish the same spots as other people fish, just with something different on on you know just with something different out there. But that's something that I do like to do. Is, you know, it's um, nuisance nuisance species proof. Yeah, you know you and you can go. Once you start applying something like that to a lake, it's it's a standout thing because everyone else probably isn't using it. You can apply them around the lake. That's the one thing I like. You put them in all the snags, and they and they become. It's not like a boilie. A boil uh, to introduce a boilie. And get the carp tuned mm. into it. You have to put a lot in. 
mm-hmm. a lot, I think. Yeah. Because you've got so many anglers to compete with that probably all putting boilies in. It's all well and good having a boilie that stands out and is a better food source, and I do believe they will recognise it as a better bait than other baits. But so having something totally different that they're eating regularly, yeah, they'll much they'll re, they'll realise they'll recognise that much quicker as they see it around the lake because they're only eating it in because it's it has its um it's different to their other stuff. So yeah, but yeah, tigers I really like, but it just depends, mate. Some lakes I would you know you can't use them, I don't use them. Do you pay much attention to what everybody else is using and go against yeah, that? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's diff- just trying to be different. Like, yeah. And it's always easy. Most people just spawn boilies. Yeah. Most people do. Not everyone does. But most people do. What a catapult boil. Most people spawn bait. For example. Most people yeah. just spawn their bait. So hence why I now try to fish as tight as I can because even if I use the same bait as them, it's still a bit different. And then you pay, take line lay into the account where you fish on the spot and you've gone from doing exactly what they're doing on paper to yeah. actually something quite different, which on a small busy lake I do believe is really it's important. It's an edge, yeah, definitely. I have no doubt it is. Like, But the the more different you can be, the more obvious the differences are, the bigger the differences, the, the better, I think. So yeah. if it's a boily dominated water, I don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't use boilies or I'm, you know, I would use them to a degree, but I would centre it around other things. To make sure different. you stand Yeah, of course yeah, it is. Give carp something else to, like, just give them something different. What's that? Do the same, catch the same, or whatever they Fine, say? To a degree, yeah. yeah, yeah I think, yeah. I do believe there's, I do believe that's a factor. Um, and I strongly believe that being different is a, on a busy, on a small busy lake, which is what I've done a lot of my fishing on, say from like three to 20 acres, that sort of lake that's got a lot of angling pressure. Yeah, the the smaller it is, the busier it is, the better it will pay to be different. Yeah. And the differences don't have to be big. They just have to be, They do, but they have, you have to just think about them. And I'm quite lucky in my, that I'm the kind of person that finds that thinking process. Quite natural. Fun, easy. Yeah. And that's what I like to do, you know, so... Um, whether I'm fishing, like I say, I've got going back to the sort of start of this, I'm not an opportunist angler as in I turn up at the lake every day and, but I am an opportunist angler in the sense is that I'm always looking for an opportunity to capitalize on. And I'm, once I have a glimmer of something, you know, I watch where fish show, if I see them showing regularly in an area, then I'm, I will hone in on it. And then you might get your little window of opportunity. But on mm. a busy lake, it won't last long. It doesn't. It will last a few weeks. And it will only last a few weeks if you are prepared to, to lie to people about what, you, you know, have you yeah. caught anything? No. Yeah, of course. Or, you know, you have to do that. Because um, if you don't, it's all well and good telling someone, mate. I've done it loads of times. You tell one or two people. And oh, I know when I tell them yeah. that it's going to get out. I know it will. But it takes a lot longer to get out than... If you just went and told everyone, yeah, you know, um, it always gets out in the end. But that is what it is. You're just trying to hold on to your yeah, your pit where you windows of opportunities are small, and you know, whilst the windows of opportunity are there, I think you have to do well. You don't have to, but I like to do whatever I can to keep that oppor- that window of opportunity as close to my chest as possible because it will blow in the end. Yeah, seasons change. You know, a month a lot can happen in a month. A month is four trips. Let's say. A month is four trips. It's not that long, but it, you know, fishing wise, it's not that long. But a month's quite a long time in terms of what is happening around the lake. So, what about spots blowing? Do you, do you do you go by what you're actually catching off it, or do you look at the yeah, spot I've and had, think that's I've just too big and blatant? Yeah, I've had spot. I don't know about. I don't know about like too big and blatant. I think it's more down to them getting hammered off of it. To yeah, do you think it's just been caught? Yeah, I think I think so. Like I've had some swims where I've dropped back thirty yards, found another spot, and just carried on catching. Yeah, 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 almost okay. picked up again. Um, I've had other swims where I'll fish three different spots. I try to fish three different spots until I'm certain that I'm. I know which one is working best at the time. So you might start with three on three spots, and then end up with two on one of them spots, but yeah. then keep baiting the other rod and then every now and then still try that other so spot. So you're bouncing fish around. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I've noticed, um, you know, one, you might have a two-week period where the middle rod or the middle spot is doing the most bites, but then that can switch. 
to the left and all of a sudden left hand rod's doing the most bites you know there's no like and that's why it's hard to have three really good spots in one swim yeah but at the same time there's normally more than one place to get a bite from out of a swim so I think you have to have your eyes you know all always be willing I kind of always try to use my third rod as like a it's yeah. either going to go on another spot with another rod or it's like a roving rod an exploratory rod so you don't need more than three rods so I certainly don't feel like I do mm. generally two is enough like as in two spots yeah so then if you can use three that gives you the opportunity to you know and I quite like to fish out of my water and stuff like that try and fish that's how you kind of explore the lake by fishing out of your swim into another. Obviously, if someone's in there, you can't do it, but you, then you're not missing out on stuff that's... A different line angle and all sorts, isn't it? Yeah, and you just often, if you sit in one swim, you see what happens in your swim, but you always see what happens in other yeah, swims. Yeah, yeah. You know, if you, it's very rare you're going to sit in a swim and you don't see one show next door. So <laughs> if you have a third rod, try it. It might end up being that that becomes a good spot, but it's all about watching. For me, I, I like to watch what the fish do, what the anglers do, and then from there. generally yeah. you find that the fish are most happy, most active in areas that aren't getting fished by carp anglers because yeah. they're, when they're, they're not you know, stupid, mate. All yeah. those swims where it's one in, one out. Yes, there'll be good swims for a reason. Generally, because there's a main feature there that the carp are magnetized to, or they've got the biggest weed bed in the lake, blah, blah, blah. But a couple of swims up from that main swim, there'll be another swim that's too weedy to fish or people think it's too weedy. And that could be a, perfect little opportunity or you fish the other side of the weed bed or a, you know there's more to like and also for me the worst thing I can do is fish the most popular swim because I can't build on it's harder to yeah, how am I going to build on that I go home someone else will go in there yeah, and then I can't get back in there anyway it's so nice, yeah. you know at times if you're targeting a carp you have to fish a swim that you know it gets caught from chances are everyone else knows as well you know so yeah, you're fishing against fish as much as you are carp, and I just try to do everything I can to not let the fish know I'm trying to catch them and not let the anglers know I'm trying to, or if I'm catching or not as well. Yeah. yeah. Talk to me about rigs. I know mm. you've refined a rig. We see it um, in topography. Your sort of, yeah, your lot of, like, I don't know, balance bait setup yeah. or whatever you want to call it, but that's pretty refined down. Mm. But you have been sort of, especially quarter days the underwater and, and your hinge stiff ring mm. you're obviously targeting big fish and you have been of the mindset of of that high pop-up being quite a deterrent yeah for smaller fish again still the same school of thought with all that so one thing that i look back on that's changed most in my fishing is that mm. i used to fish um i used to fish when i was a kid i used to fish with long hairs like inch and a half two inch hairs sometimes yeah. three inches i used but i found in the end that three is probably a bit long so I used to fish like 10-inch rigs, a long hair of, say, an inch and a half, two inches. No one does that. No. Really. No. Um, then I started fishing tall pop-ups, hinges and that, which is definitely, definitely, definitely a big fish method. It, yeah? It does deter small fish. I've seen it loads in the edges. I've seen it. You see it on underwater. Your little fish re- refuse them. Big fish don't. I've seen you it. You whacked it on the gravel, mate, yeah. as well, didn't you? Yeah, like, because that's, that's kind of the irrelevant bit in a way. It's just yeah. the... And I've seen it, my, I've seen it time, like hinges in the edge isn't something I've done a lot, but I've done it on lakes where there's loads of small fish and I've watched them eating all round it. And you think, I'm going to have a hook on them in a minute. Big or bigger one turns up, might be 25 pound rather than 12. They just take it straight away. So that's the one thing I've changed. But that sort of, that style of rig doesn't really suit the way I fish now. Mm. Fishing with bits and pieces tight on a spot. You can't be whopping a big old hinge in the middle of it. <laughs> my fishing is now has now become more about catching everything that comes onto my spot. Yeah. And just although that's kind of steps back and away from this sort of one track mind, ignore all the small fish, ignore all that. But those rigs tangled and that, mate. Like them rigs, the long hair one and all that, they used to tangle a lot. And although I'm sure they were big fish selective in the, in some ways, casting out in the dark, you were never certain if it was tangled. You, you know, you had to see the rig going out. And mm. also putting your rods back out after a bite, it might take 10 casts sometimes till I knew for certain it wasn't tangled. Jeez. And I've learned over the years that that is not good on a busy lake. The more casting you do, the, the, 
it's detrimental to your fishing. And mm. especially when you've had a bite, you want to get the rod out in one chuck if you can. So the rig I use for literally everything, well, pretty much everything these days, I didn't have a little pop-up rig I could fish over bait and I started using it one winter because I wanted to fish bits and pieces. I think it was maggot actually at the time um, and boardy crumb. I didn't really feel like I had a rig that suited it. Yeah. A hinge didn't, a chod didn't. And my long hair rig, it's all, I could have fished it over it, but I wanted to fish a sh- with a short pop-up. I just wanted to use a tiny little pop-up. So I started using it that winter. I trialled it on a few um, little lakes first. And, mate, ever si- I've lost so few carp on that since. I've got it. I've re- oh, so <laughs> I write everything down. Like I've got my last, I don't know, four, three or four maybe. I don't actually know how long, but I've got several years of fishing written down. Handwritten in a, like in a, a diary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How every single trip, weather, times, what times I put my rods out, how far I put them out, how many spawns I put out, what I put out, what I saw show, what I caught. Yeah. diagrams of the trees like, like I could go back now and retrace my last four or five years fishing I'm the to same, the yeah. to the um yeah to the letter to the swim yes yeah, so I day. can tell you every yeah. carp I've lost every swim I've caught it from every bait I've caught it on every rig I've caught it on what the weather was like what the pressure was like what the wind was doing I've got that all written down and the I could count up how many carp I've lost on that rig since then but it's not very many at all and it never tangles. Yeah. It never tangles. I can fish it with a pop-up, a bottom bait, and a wafter. It doesn't matter. I can fish it in the edge. I can fish it out in the lake. You know, it doesn't tangle. I can fish it with everything, and they don't fall off. You know. Yeah, what more do you want? That is, yeah. And I don't get me wrong, I still use a chod or a hinge. I can't chuck it in a weed, but I never fish like that with chods and that anyway. I don't like fishing in the weed. No? No, I'm not. When I used to chod fish, I feel still fish for decent drops. Did you? mm don't why? Because no, you're just not confident. Don't like chucking the them in the weed. No, I've never just. Not, I've, I always prefer to know it's clean. I don't yeah. like the wondering. Um, I'll fish over light weed with it, short yeah, weed, yeah. but I don't fish into thick weed like some people do. No, like my, like. my chods were basically hinges. You know, I'd have them. Um, my top bead would be 14 inches from the lead. Right. No, my bottom bead would be seven inches from the lead. And that's four. So you've and then I'd have 14 yeah. inches between the two. So. From lead to the top beads, like 21 inches or whatever. Yeah, so you're not catering for a big old... No, I'm not, I'm not fishing that way. No. It was like, it would present over light weed, but... Um, and the same with hinges. I always fished them generally on spots, on silt. Yeah. With spreads of boilies. It's more the... Like, it's more what I'm feeding for me. With When I used to use those rigs, a lot of it was about... I was boilie fishing. Boilie, yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, that's... But the rig I use now, I just use it for everything because it suits everything I do. I can ping it out there and then pitch black, close my eyes and not watch. I don't even watch my rigs anymore in flight. Mm-hmm. I do to it, like, but I'm not looking at that hook bait to see if it's tangled because I know it ain't going to be. Yeah. And if it is, you're, you're talking like one in, I don't know, a couple of times a year that might tangle. In fact, I wouldn't even say that. It just don't tangle. It never does. And that's a massive, massive thing to have in your... Yeah, huge bit of confidence. Yeah, you know, because then I've just... All I've got to do when I rechuck is get the line right, get the drop I need. Or it, Whereas in the past, with those rigs I used to use more, especially in my bottom brake presentation, which suits the style of fishing I do more these days, bits and pieces, mm. tight on the deck, that's a bottom brake presentation, really. Um, it would tangle. Yeah. And if it didn't tangle, because it would tangle on occasion – if I didn't know for certain it hadn't tangled, I would have to redo it in the fear that it had. Lots of the time it hadn't tangled, but plenty of the time it had. And taking that out of my fishing, just that recasting, you know, I'm known to be fussy. And over the years, I've tried to take that out of my fishing a little bit, being right. too fussy. I'm really, really fussy when I put my rods out initially, having baited and caused all the disturbance, but... When I, once I've got a bite nowadays, I'm much more, my priority is far more get a decent drop on the right line rather than cast six times for the best drop you've ever had in the world. You know, because all my bait's tight on a spot. Yeah. Does it really matter if I'm fishing 12, 14 inches difference where the lead's landed? One landed really hard, one landed a bit softer. Lead's only got to hit a stone. 
Yeah. And you're going to get a better drop than if it hits sand. Yeah, of course. And that could be an inch. So I've learned to take that element out of my fishing because there were times years ago where I would just cast and cast and cast. And by the time you put the rod back down, you think, yeah. I've just fucked my whole yeah. morning by doing that. Completely. So that rig has become my go-to based on those things. You know, it doesn't tangle. I can fish it with everything. So I don't have to, it takes the rig sort of element out of the way for 90% of what I do. It's super reliable. Yeah. I've no doubt it's an effective hooker of fish because I know when I feel like I should catch, I will. Yeah. And yeah, you know, it's reliable. It's versatile. What more? And, you know, in those situations where I want to get my rod straight back out, I can with that without any... Yeah, it's not overly complicated in terms of ages of tie. Nah. I think the only thing that, that, that was quite, like, if you like, different was that the shrink tube was all the way down, if you like, mm. through the sort of the line of line or mm. all the yes, way it, line through to where, yeah. yeah, all the and way. And I leave the shot on all the time. People are always like, why yeah, do you leave the shot on? Yeah. So whether I push with a bottom bait or not, I always have a shot on. Wide gape hook pattern always? Wide gape always, yeah. I love those wide gapes. Like, I've used them for, I've used them for, God knows, a long time and they'll, they'll, I will use them till I die. You know they are my favourite. Always sharpened as well. Yeah, I haven't used a non-sharpened. Even on time. like mm. silty lake beds or everything. Corrosive yeah, yeah, you everything, do, yeah. yeah. I wouldn't. I can't. I don't like. It. I don't like not using them sharpened. Yeah, it's like a. Um, yeah, I don't like. Even yeah, when they used working. to corrode really bad, I still used them. Did you? You reel them in, they're all black and rusty, and you used to think, fucking hell, probably better off using a non-sharpened one here, but I couldn't. You know, no. And there's ways now of protecting the points and stuff, isn't there? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. you can protect your hook points with you know, stuff that stops them corroding. And that, that was always the biggest fear with a sharpen is they corrode to a point where are they... Um, yeah, even sharp anymore. Yeah, sharp but they are now. Um, so yeah, always sharpened hook. And always a, always a rotary style sort of heli setup. Yeah, or in, I use either... If I fish in the edge, I use a five ounce inline. Yeah. If I fish out in the pond, I use a heli, yeah. Never a leg clip. I don't hate them, yeah. Why? Just, <laughs> just not... don't like them, no. No, not no, a fan. No, they're good. Just, no, I just don't see the... Uh, I don't see what a lead clip offers over a helicopter rig. Neither of them two are like instant hookers of the carp, are they, in terms no. of... There's a little bit of movement on a lead clip and you've got a little bit of movement on a heli in terms of the beads. A lead clip, you can take lead on and off, it's easy, yeah, I, I granted. But... Land like a helicopter is so much more versatile in what you can fish it over. Yeah, you've got a bit more buffer. Yeah, you've got you? the you just sort of doctor it to how you want to doctor it. The lead, the lead goes in first. The rig. I just I don't see what a lead clip, and I've never really, really looked at a lead clip and thought that it offers anything more than a helicopter. In fact, the reverse. I think the helicopters, and now. You see loads of people, they're much more popular helicopter rigs. Yeah, 100%. Now that people are more educated and more So you aware. might go back to a leg clip, mate. No, I never. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've ever really used them. Like maybe when I was, a, I used to use inlines when I was a kid. What, even on zigs? Or you, you on everything, about? mate. On everything. I used to use loads, yeah. yeah. I used, no, I used to run in rigs first. Yeah. Running rigs, I used to lose loads. Um, then I used inlines, but I used to use like small long shanks. And I used to lose millions because... The, the nature of a long shank when it hooks in the lip, there's quite a lot of the eye will protrude the lip and the lead bouncing around will just pull it out, pop those hooks yeah. out. Um, the wide gape hook patterns, they just stay in once they're in, they're done. But helicopters versatile, similar to a lead clip in the way that it behaves, but I just don't see the, maybe someone can tell me, but I don't know what a lead clip offers that a helicopter doesn't. And I don't know what a lead clip can do better than a helicopter can do. Because in terms of impact with a lead, there is no real difference and it's not as versatile in terms of what you can present it over. And I dare say that tangle wise and that I don't think they're any better. So don't know. For me, I don't really like a lead clip. Millions of people do is what it is. And it, mm. I think rigs don't really matter too much. They, which is kind of a contradiction because I'm quite obsessive over them. But if you look at, if you tied a, every, if you tied up every rig that's ever caught a car and laid them on a table, you'd need a fucking big table. So <laughs> you true. Um, you know, they suit, it's important that your rigs suit you as an angler and what the way you fish. That is important, very important. But yeah. you could give one rig that's really good for one guy to another guy who does it a different way and it wouldn't be so good. So it's important that you know that what you use suits how you fish yeah, or how you are fishing with that rig at the time. But on the whole, I think you've got a small list of things that are important. They don't tangle. 
they reset, that's handy. They don't tangle, they reset, they've got a sharp hook and you put them in the right place. And I think, you know, and Jump the leader is prese- you, you're attaching them to is presenting well. But yeah, I use inlines a lot for my edge fishing. Five ounce inlines, same rig, just on a, just on a drop off inline, which I don't really like casting massive leads in the lake too, too much. Five ounce leads on a heli is not really the one. No. The heli, it doesn't, helicopter doesn't eject the lead on the take. That's probably the one thing a lead, yeah, lead does got. on the bite. But you can still fish like that over a heli if you want to. Um, but yeah, I use two things. So I just use that rig on either a helicopter if I'm fishing out in the lake or an inline if I'm fishing. Um, and when I've since been going abroad a bit, I will fish a lead clip with a 10 ounce lead on it. Okay. Just because it's 10 ounces of lead and I need it just to pop straight off and I'm lowering it down onto the spot. So, and I don't think the fish are, they are fitting a bit, mu- they're a bit muggier out there, aren't they? <laughs> Muggy <laughs> continental um, car. I'm not worried so much about the rigs in those situations. Yeah. Like, like I say, a helicopter and a lead clip, they're not vastly different, but in terms of casting them around and moving around a lake, a small lake in England, for me, a helicopter oh, edges yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Like, but I'll happily, I'll happily use a lead clip in Europe. In Europe, if I'm putting a massive lead on it, which I do not want. If you put a 10 ounce lead on a helicopter, you want that the fish is going to come up the line. And then you've yeah. got to wind the lead back to the swivel. So, you know. Yeah, you want that gone. And I'm not as worried possible. about it. But yeah, for it, in England, I use helicopters. Or European England. fishing, you referenced it there, mate. Exciting. <laughs> yeah, I really like it. It's like something different. Um, it's it's just fun. Let's just find it fun. Like I have that buzz that I used to get more years ago. Um, like I like the adventure side. It reminds me a bit of being like a kid again, kind of out yeah. on my own in a, people always say, Oh, I love it. Like, you know, I love it. Just being on my own. I actually don't. No, no, I don't like, don't like, I wouldn't want to go with people. Like, you go mates a lot though, don't you? Mm, no, I don't go with, I, no, France. Yeah. yeah abroad. France is always with mates. Yeah, I don't it? even know if I'd want to do it on my own. Yeah. Like, People start to say in England, they always moan that the lakes are busy and they'd love to fish a lake where they didn't see any anglers. I'm not like that. I actually like to see someone. Right. I wouldn't want to sit down the lake on my own catching loads of carp and never see a person. <laughs> like, it doesn't... It's actually quite... And that probably goes back to me being a kid again. We always fished in groups. Yeah. And it's good to have mates. I don't I don't understand anyone that, like... I bet there ain't golfers out there that are like, oh, yeah, all I want to do is play golf on my own, like... I find it... No, sharing experience is what it's yeah, about, Yeah, that's isn't what it? I mean. Like, don't get me wrong, I don't want anglers around me all the time to the point where you can't... Um, where it affects you, it's detrimental to fishing, but I love to have people around me when yeah. I'm at the lake. I love to have... I love it when guys come in my swim and have a cup of tea. Yeah. Hopefully you don't get a bite when they're there. <laughs> you know, but I like that. I like to have... Um, I like to make friends with people. I like to talk to people. And whenever someone says, oh, you know, yeah, I just want to be at the lake. I'm like, I never understand that. I don't... Mm. That is not me at all. As much as I can be secretive and all that, I love having a mate come down to see me and that, you know, and if I'm sat on a lake on my own, I find it a bit, a bit not boring because it's, you know, the fishing is enough, but it's nice. Yeah. And also going abroad, like I was kind of going back to your point, I wouldn't want to just go and get on the ferry or get, sorry, get on the train and drive out six hours into France on my own. And I don't know, it's like... No, it don't appeal to me either, to be fair. No, right? I just... It's, it's, I love looking at a mate in the car next to me and being like, is this the lake? Or yeah, where the fuck do we go now? Let's get, like, where should we get food? Or have you, do, like, it's nice to have that little bit of sort of companionship um, and someone to share what's a really, because otherwise you just got to come home from a trip on your own. All these things happen because they do. Lots of st- weird stuff happens. And it's just like, you just tell the, you tell yeah. the story. It's, it's just, got no relevance. To no, it, it's it? just nice to have someone there with you to share the moment. And like, I think it's, a, it's a, out there. It's a lot more selfish. Like, what do you mean? A lot less selfish. Sorry. I'm not going out. I'm not going fishing with like one carp in my mind. Yeah. You know, like Bridger who works with me now. He always, he always holds it against me that when we first met him, I just used to lie to him flat out all the time. Cause I met him at the lake. I used to lie to him all the time when I was fishing because I didn't really know him. Liked yeah. him, but I never, never told him, fuck all. So he always takes a piss out of me now for that, for like this sort of deceit that I showed him for the first six months that I knew him or whatever. 
which all came to light as we became better friends and I could like, trust him. Like, but like, <laughs> it's not like that when you're going out there. It's like we're going here for four or five days. I like to kind of go to place, you know, it sounds like I've been out there millions of times. I haven't. I'm going to go out there a lot. I'm going next week. I'm going to the south of France next week. And I plan to go much more regularly. Mm. I was going to go a lot over winter, but they shut the border. We couldn't go. Um, last time I went was November. I'm trying to go like once a month or so. But it's different. It's like, it, it is all about, for me, it's kind of all about two of you doing it. You and your, me and my mate are going out there to places we've never seen before. Because I feel I don't know where I'm going. You know, I wouldn't want to just, just turning up on my own would be, be so weird. Yeah. What are you, what's, what are you like? I'm not a unsociable kind of person. Like I say, I like having people in my swim. I like having people to talk to. There's times in your fishing in, on, in the UK for me because I fish busy lakes where you have to have an element of secrecy about you. But Sorry. it's not, nat- that's not a natural, that's not me, nat- that's not my natural personality to be mm. that way. That's a necessity to achieve something that you're trying to achieve. You have to be aware of the situation you're in. And make sure that it doesn't, you know, not being that way doesn't cost you. But when you're going out to France or Belgium or whatever for a week fishing on your own, and I'm probably never going to go back to that place. Yeah. So much out there. I don't have any intentions of returning to places, really. Why not bring a mate and have someone with you that can, you know, enjoy it with you? Someone to do your pictures with, someone to wake up in the morning with, someone to talk to, someone to help you with a boat. It was yeah. just, I look back at the trips I've had and they'd have been shit on my own. Yeah, definitely. But they, I look back at them and they were so much fun. But having that angler with me was a big part of that. What sort of random stuff's gone on, mate, in these trips? Oh, fucking hell. Mate, just little things like, first of all, it's always, even, are you even at the right place? That's like the first, always the sort of first bit. It's like, where are we going? Or, um, I remember run, my car battery ran. I always have nightmares. I've missed trains. My car battery's gone. You drive down a wrong road. I've been stuck in the car. I've been searching for somewhere to get food because you think, oh, we'll get it once we get there. There's and no then way. you get there and you think, fuck, we haven't. Now what? There's no phone signal, a lot of it. And like little things like that, getting COVID tests, like oh, that yeah. becomes such a big, those like, holy shit, we've got to get these tests done. How are we going to get them done? They become such a big far, a big part of the trip that would never normally exist in England. Yeah. So much of it is not about the fishing. Or so much of what I enjoy about it isn't actually the fishing. It's driving from lake to lake. I've always done that as well when we've been... I've tried to go to a few different... Many places as I can. Like It's not really pay lake stuff either, is it? No, like, just random. I just, yeah, yeah. I've got, luckily, I've got, quite, um, I've got quite good contacts, I suppose is the word that I can rely on, you know, yeah. where can we go from here today? And then we just go to different places. And once I've done a night there, I'd quite like to go somewhere different. Two nights somewhere maybe and then on. I think the last place, when I went to um, Holland in uh, the last, end of the summer, last, I think we fished seven lakes in five days or seven venues in five days. Cool, Belter. Fi- was yeah. it Amsterdam? Well, we catch that Belter. Or five venues, but we packed up and reset up on lakes seven times. So like seven moves in four nights or something. Yeah. Some would like do a night on a lake, go back, do a day. He's like, and my mate Mitch, who done it with me, I think he burnt out a little bit towards the end. But I've absolutely loved it. Like, And th- actually that was part of the fun. It's like, right, We'll drive all this way there, do a mm. night there, and then we'll go and go somewhere else. And then maybe we'll go back there. And It's just very different to what you're doing over, or what I'm doing over here. And you go out there for a trip. And I dare say, even if you blanked, you still have a laugh. Yeah. Because of the stuff that comes with it. You know, some of the food we've bought from the supermarkets and stuff has been so bad. What? And then you, when you buy it, you're like, this looks fucking lovely. And then you go to like this remote place and that's all you've got to eat and you eat it and you're just like, oh my God, this is dreadful. Like, What? I remember we, we went we, we went to France. Oh, we, what did Mitch say? We ate like rats. We ate like rats for the week. And then on the last day, <laughs> on the last day, it was like a kilometre boat drive. On the last night, we, we'd done the boat drive back to the car. We drove into a village and we bought new food because we'd ate this shit all week and it was mm. horrible. Um we was eating pasta and sausages, basically, because the, the other meat we had was so bad. We bought loads of burgers, and we thought they would be, like, seasoned, but they weren't. They were. It was basically mints. Have you ever ate mints? Um, like, you know, like, packeted mints here, like lean beef mints yeah. or whatever. 
Have you ever eaten that without any seasoning on it? Never. Just out the pan. Anyone listening, next time you cook mince, before you add anything to it, just see what it tastes like. What Straight does it the, taste like? It's horrible, Water. mate. It's got no seasoning in it. But anyway, bought all these burgers, and that's what they tasted like. <laughs> the chicken went off quite quickly because it was really hot. So we ended up eating these little sausages and pasta for dinner, um, which weren't a very nice, you know, it is. It it was a means survival to survival food, isn't it? But the last night we, I say we drove, we uh, we boated a k- kilometre to the car, driven into a local village, but half an hour away. We bought like bought some beers, ice creams, blah blah. blah and we went into a butcher's and we bought this big selection of um, kebabs, lovely nice. marinated. No, we we then got back to the lake and it was getting dark. We were losing the light. We got our COVID test while we were there, and we got back to the lake. We boated back to the swims, got the rods out. It's dark. And then we were like, right, let's have them kebabs. And we left them in the car. So we'd gone, we were, we were looking forward. It's like our last supper, you know, and we didn't have any other meat at this point. So we, we ended up having um, pasta on its own that night. And these kebabs were in the car because they were too far away. That's we were like, we're not going back to get them. So we had, um, and Mitch was cooking the pasta and I tasted it. And I was like, it's not, it's not got enough salt in it. And I poured the salt into the pan. And as I did it, like a big block of it kind of fell in. Anyway, I really like salt, so it didn't bother me too much. I'd rather it was too salty than not salty enough. And Mitch was eating the pasta and he was moaning about how salty it was. And then he ended up throwing up for the next like 20 minutes in his bag because it was so salty. And like things like that are just like, they're the things that, as the fishing was great and we had a good time fishing, but they're the things that I look back on more. Yeah. Are just those funny little happenings, the things you see, the things that happen that you never expected. You know, we we know we're going to go to a lake and we're going to put our rods out and we you don't know what you're going to catch, but there's so much more to it than than just that. It's the experience, isn't it? Whereas in England it isn't an experience really. Yeah, you've done it. It's not an experience now. I don't feel like I don't feel like it's an experience anymore. I feel like over here I just feel like you feel like going through the motions to some extent? Kindly, no, no, kind, kind of, but no, no. Like I say, when I'm fishing, I'm fishing and it, 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 it grabs me, it encapsulates me, but I know what I'm getting every time I go. Yeah. I know that I'm going to go to the lake. My mind's going to be pretty much set on a couple of swims. I'm going to get there. There's every chance there's going to be people in them. And if that's the case, it's like, um, what? Are, and then you're like, oh, great. What do you do now? Whereas when we go away, it doesn't feel like that. You just, you know, you're probably going to have a whole lake to yourself mm. in the middle of nowhere. And there's just a lot more to it. There's a lot more to enjoy than just the fishing. Whereas in England, it's, you know, it's largely just about the fishing side of it. But the fishing the journey to the lake there. is nothing for me. Yeah, of course. It. What do I do? Get on the M25, I might stop in a garage and get a coffee. If I'm really unlucky, I'll get a puncture. But that does, I'm not going to be like, Haha, I had a puncture. That was funny, wasn't it? Yeah. You'd be like, for fuck's sake, that ruined my trip. Whereas if it happens in France, you will you will look back on it and be like, fucking hell, remember when we had that puncture? All of a sudden, what was a shit situation has become like... Yeah. A, there's funny a little like, story. Yeah, and that's what that's why I like going out there. The lakes are different. The fishing's different. It's all about broadening your horizons. I want to learn to use a boat. I want to be a better boat angler. Um, It's just different, mate. It's just a different... Any issues with, like, people, weird stuff like that going on on public lakes, or has it all been pretty fa- pretty fine? Um, Cameras knocking about and stuff like that, has it all been no, okay? I think so. Like, um, no, we ain't really had... It. When, I was, when we was in Amsterdam, that was a bit sketchy because we was right in the, um, we was right in the heart of Amsterdam. But, like, the places we've gone to really have been quite remote. That's what I try to... That's yeah, what I okay. try to look for is places that are quite remote. Um Fish another place in Amsterdam. That was a massive park, like in the heart of the city. That was apparently quite bad for thefts and that, but we didn't see that side of it. We only done yeah. a night, and we were right out on the island. Someone put a fucking great dent in my truck, which was quite annoying. I don't know how they did it, but they basically ripped the tailgate off of my truck, which I've still got to get fixed. Cheers. That was annoying. But no, you see like weird people. You know, you meet the odd random guy and all that. But no, when I go out there, I've tried to go to places that are a little bit more remote. Yeah. You know, you do yeah. see the odd people. Um, <laughs> we had a funny moment with some kids that jumped in in one of the latest films we did. They were, I started to do like an evening opener thing. 
And as I've started talking, these eight kids behind me just ran and bombed into the lake. Just little silly <laughs> things like that, you yeah. know, that just... But the fishing-wise uh, as well, mate, there's been some cracking fish that you've Yeah, I'll make the fish... Yeah, like, there's no... Uh, that's the kind of thing... That's the sort of next step I'm trying to take, really, is to start to find carp that are... I'll try to find really nice carp. It's quite easy to go abroad and find cool lakes with cool fishing and that. We're blessed in England with the carp we've got. Yeah. We have got a lot of really nice carp. A lot of the fish I see from France and stuff, they're not... I don't want to generalise France because that would be wrong to do so, but they're not English carp. I say English carp, Dutch carp, Belgian carp. Well, you know, they're a little bit different to the French fish as as a um, as a generalisation. So you're talking about aesthetics, how they look, just and what, what they look like. Yeah, you. like it's easy to go to France catch loads of big ones. Yeah, loads of Abbey Lake like fish bit, are nice. Yes, they are, but I don't want to go Abbey. This is the last place I'll go. No, because yeah. it's just I'm as well stay in England. Yeah. Um, it's, but I want to try and find lakes that have got nice, like really nice carp in, but also offer the um, the adventure, the wilderness, the yeah. that side of it. That's kind of, what was it? What did Gaz and um, Samir call that series? Boy Scout, Boy Scout business. business. Yeah, it's a good yeah. Na- little name that. Yeah. And it is a bit like that, you know, having a campfire. And it's nice to catch carp. But I've, I, know in, I know in myself that once I've done it a bit, Keep going to big lakes with no one there, and it's really beautiful. And but the carp are essentially why I'm going, you know. So I've caught carp out there, and I'm like, if I caught this in England, it wouldn't like you know, it wouldn't do much for me. It's yeah, so the novelty of that travel wears off, doesn't it? Yes, and it's like once the adventure side of it, you become a little bit, and you, it, but going to different places every single time. You will all, it will always be an adventure. Yeah. Just like the first time you go to a new lake, that's always one of your favourite trips, like because you're seeing everything new for the first time. Mm. That's always going to be there. But I think there's, Europe's so big; there's so many carp out there that if I if I'm if I try hard enough, I should be able to find what I want in the terms of the type of fishing we're doing, but also the type of carp that we will catch along the way. Yeah, because I know that after a prolonged period of time, I'm going to start to go right. And I'm already thinking it. Yeah. I want to catch carp that make me go, wow. But I also want the... So, you know, you're always wanting more. It goes back to what I said before. I'm always... Yeah. Always trying to better stuff. But for now, I just want to... All I want to do is go out there, have a bit of fun, improve as an angler, doing that kind of fishing. I feel like once I learn the... Like, I'm yet to be out there in a big storm in a boat, things like that. Right, like, yeah, Using yeah. a boat's quite hard, mate, because I'm yeah. fussy as well, yeah? So I'm like, I've still got that really fussy nature with me. Anyone come right out there and toss a rig over the side, that's all well and good. We can all do that. But I want to become a guy that can go out there in all weathers yeah. and fish with the meticulous nature that I can apply when I'm fishing in England on a big pit in a wind. I want to feel like I'm doing that, not just going out there, tossing a rig over the side, yeah. and throwing a, hand, a couple of handfuls of bait around it, which has worked for me plenty. Yeah. But I want to be good in a boat so that I can bring that back here. You'll get there, man. And, you know, and that only comes with doing it. Exactly. I'm still, I'm still reversing. I still go, always do the wrong way first before I get the right way. I'm like, I want to turn the boat left in reverse, and I put it right, and you think, fuck's sake. So little things like that. Eventually, I won't do that anymore, and that's a sign that... It yeah, becomes second nature. Tommy, yeah. The classic example, Foreman, is half man, half boat. He's good in a boat. I've heard oh, he's that. He's incredible in a yeah, boat. Yeah, I've heard that. And that's what, what I want to be, and yeah. because that will benefit me here. And what it will also do is it will open, it will broaden my horizons in the UK because I'll, I'll start to look at, like I said before, fish a lot of small lakes. It's predominantly what I do, small, busy lakes. It's kind of what my... Because I've always actually enjoyed that fishing against the anglers thing as much as like... I say I'm trying to hide what I'm doing and all that. I like that side yeah. of it. I like fishing against the anglers as well. But I'd like to be able to, I wouldn't want to fish a big lake over here with a load of guys that are really good in a boat and come unstuck. Yeah. Because that would annoy me. It'd frustrate me that I can't do it. Um, so part it's part of what I'm doing out in Europe is building that knowledge, having loads of fun along the way, but building up to maybe... And next, and taking my fishing over here to maybe something a different again, whereas I fish big lakes all the time where I can use a boat. And I try yeah. and 
because those sort of lakes you you will kind of you'll get a bit of that adventure feel and the uh, it's something about a big lake isn't there of course there is um, I'm not daunted by big lakes I don't like a small canal daunts me more than a massive lake because well, you why. can't see it yeah something about a canal canals scare me I don't like canals I feel out of place on a canal do you? yeah I feel like not out of place I just feel um, a restricted I feel away I feel yeah I feel like knowing they're not there because they're probably up there I just find it really I can't settle on a canal yeah. When I look at them, I find them boring. The banks are there, like, don't know. Don't like them. Don't like canals. Don't really like rivers. But a big lake, mm. I a lot. I I've, the ones I've fished, I've thrived off of that. Yeah. That the the size and make. Whereas a big canal scares the life out of me. A small canal scares me more than a massive lake. So I'd like to build that as part of you know. That's also a part of what I'm doing in Europe. Well, my plan, sorry, to keep going to Europe and learning becoming more um, comfortable doing a different style of fishing yeah. is so that I can introduce that to my fishing over here and start fishing loads of big lakes because there's loads out there. Exactly. It's and, another uh, dimension to your angle, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's something different to do. Like, But you know, my heart will always lie with that competitive small lake fishing. It's what I like. I do like doing it. But, you know, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to broaden my horizons yeah, a little bit. Right. And Europe's a good way of doing that because... You have a great fun along the way with mates. You know, start when the trip starts, it starts. When it ends, it ends. You put it behind you. If it goes bad, who cares? If it goes well, great. Whereas in England, I don't have that mentality. It's like, if it goes bad, yeah. I want to go back, make it good. If it goes good the next time, I want it to be better the next. And then it's like a, you sort of get on a hamster wheel that doesn't stop spinning because you just won't stop running. Yeah. Whereas out there, it's, like, it's a slightly different vibe. And also it suits me. For, it's great for work because I can go out there I can film everything I'm doing. Yeah. I can make what I think are good films that people enjoy watching, that I enjoy making, because I do enjoy making the films. And everyone wins. You know, I'm having a good time. My time is used wisely in, in both a personal sense and for, what, and for I'm, work, what, I'm lucky to, what I'm lucky to have as a work sense. Everything's great. Whereas over here in England, when I want to keep everything to my chest, it's not always as... Hence why now I'm like, right, I'll take my laptop fishing with me and I'll do my mm. laptop-based work whilst I'm fishing in England. Whereas in France, I just, the laptop ain't coming nowhere fucking near me. That's that, <laughs> that's staying at home. I'm going fishing, but I film it. So yeah. it's all about make, like striking a bit of a balance to sort of make myself happy on several different levels. And it does offer that. And there's so many, there's so many lakes and so many carp out there. Yeah, opportunities right. endless. And another man you've introduced with opportunities, Mr. Shelley, mate. Your relationship mm. with that man. I think mm. you've got to take a lot of credit there because, and I said this to him in a previous podcast because he's been on here a couple of times. Brilliant bloke. One of the funniest blokes I think I've met. He makes me cry with laughter every time he I see funny, him. Isn't he? He's yeah. funny. <laughs> but I said to him, a few years ago, there was a lot of people with assumptions about Jim. And if you listen to all that and you, and you sort of, you'd never met him, you'd believe all that hype. And luckily I've never the person to do that. I always meet people at face value and take them as I see them. But if you'd have listened to that, you probably would have had a complete different perception of him. But since doing topography and coming out on that hunter series that you did with him, like it's, not that he needed it, but in terms of the difference of opinion that people have had and the stuff he's done subsequently, even the stuff with us, people see him for who he is. He's he's an absolute, he's an absolute machine in terms of carp Mm. fishing, but he's a funny, funny bloke, mate. I think like, obviously I remember that time right pretty vividly because I had a lot of, you know, a lot of um, people saying, don't do it. Really? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, Oh, suicide for your business and all that. Like, but, but um, even like friends close to me, just like, oh, it's not, it's not a good idea. But, but I think what <clears throat> people don't always realise, it's like I'm not always doing things for my business as such. Like the whole gym thing, it wasn't about doing it for the business. It wasn't like that. It was like. He's a guy who's got this incredible character. It's mm. not always good. It can be bad, like everyone can be. Yeah. He's incredible, but he's got this very unique character. You don't meet many people like him. 
he has this string of big fish captures and this white, this obsession for carp fishing like that you want to document and if you just do everything based on like oh is it good for business you don't you don't know till you've done it for a start you have to take risks i think in life to yeah you always, if you don't take any risks then well you're not living are you no i don't think so and for me it wasn't a risk i didn't as much as everybody said, oh, well, you know, he's, and I just thought, well, hang on a minute. I'm not going to go, like, say all them bad things you want to say, fine. Half of them, probably not true. Maybe some of them are. I'm not here to comment or say that. But it's not about that. I'm not going out of him to talk about, all I wanted, all I wanted to do was go out of him and talk about his fishing and why he loved carp fishing so much. Mm. That was what the first one was about. The first thing I did with him was, why do you love carp fishing? And I remember the first time that went out, people were like, wow, you know, because it hadn't been done with Jim. There'd been films made of him and stuff and people um, had opinions on him, but I don't really think anyone had ever really sat him down and just gone, tell us about, and I think the more you watch him, yeah, and that is him that you see, you see that there's his grumpy side, his happy side, his obsessive side, his... You know, you see his tenacity. You you see the good in him. You see the maybe some of the bad in him. Well, I see the good and the bad in him by being around him. You learn to. There's not a lot from my experience. There's not a lot of bad in him. No. Um, he might over the years not have always conducted himself in the best way possible, but I think at now, certainly now he's quite a different guy. I think he's learned from his mistakes. Learned not to. Um, react to things on social media as much. But at, at heart of, at the heart of that series and the heart of why we did it, I wanted to do it with him was just because he's one of the best that's ever done it. Exactly. And I know for certain, a lot of people that have watched it have totally changed their mind on Jim. I've had lots of people over the last two, I don't know how long it is, two or three years come up to me and say, you know, fair play, you, I thought this and now I don't, or I thought, you know, I thought that was a bad idea and I think you I think it was a good idea, blah, blah, blah. It's been great for subography. It's been good for Jim. Mm. Um, it's, I feel like it's, I don't want to say put him back on the map because that is kind of the wrong way. He's always been on the map, but I think it's just shown him, shown people, him in a light that now you can make an, a bit more of an opinion on a guy. Um, and I never knew Jim that well. I could, I knew him well-ish, but not really. You know, Jim's quite, you've got to be quite involved with him for him to sort of let you in, if you know what I mean. But I was always sure people would be interested. And at the end of the day, I wanted to make a film that was just about Jim and his carp fishing. And yeah. we didn't know it was going to be a series on go. We never, you know, it, it kind of, it's turned into what it's turned into. Me and him have got a really good relationship now. I get on really well with him. <laughs> You know, we have a laugh. <laughs> you wind him up. Yeah, but it gives you an ins- it gives people an insight into into probably one of them. You know, hundred years from now, he'll be one of yeah. He'll be one of a very small handful of names that that will always always he'll be in. He'll, you know, he'll never be forgotten. Um, and for good reason. Mm. And I think you know. I take quite a lot of pride in the fact that some people or quite a lot of people have said it changed my opinion in him. Like topography has always been about that. It's always been about the characters as much as the fishing. Um, we've always tried to pick guys who've got a bit about them and can be in totally different ways. doesn't mean we're choosing one kind of person, but it is about the characters as much as it is the fishing. Um, and I think Jim's a really good example of how you can – how a great character and a great angler can combine to make what I think are really enjoyable, what I, what I hope are really enjoyable films for people to watch. They're really good, mate. Um, and it does show him, it does show him in a light, but I think it's different to what he's been shown in in the past. And I know he's no angel. I'm not, I'm not sitting here to say anyone has ever been wronged by Jim. You're, you know, I'm not saying that no, for a no, second. No, of course not. But I think there's a lot of people out there who pass judgment based on what they hear more than what... I 100%. I think yeah. the majority of the people who've never even met him, do you mm. know what I mean, who are going by 
whatever's been said and yeah. not people who've had dealings with him in the past, not at all. But and I've yeah, had a lot of people message me, mate, saying, oh, well, we fell out over this and that. And I know, you know, I know he's fallen out of people, but yeah, that is what it is, mate. I think a lot of anglers have their ruckuses with people. When you're fishing all the time, all around the country, yeah, and it means that much to you, that will happen. But um, yeah, we just want, or I just wanted, we just wanted as a, you know, personally, I wanted to do it. Um, and for topography, we just wanted to make films with a guy who's good at catching carp. Yeah, you can catch a few. Yeah, and that's always what we want to do. But we also wanted to do it with a guy who's got something that others haven't got. Yeah. And you two have got a good chemistry, mate. Mm. Like, that's good as well. Because it adds another dimension to the videos, doesn't it? Like, yeah, I think so. You yeah. two. And that was never on purpose. Like, we just no. kind of... But I like taking the piss out of him, like, and... He just keeps offering sword fights to Yeah, me. all the time. All the time. Cut you up on that. Cut off constantly. <laughs> yeah, like, it is. It's, it's different, like... Again, we just try to always do something a little bit different with our films, obviously, because um, like we're at war with YouTube, I suppose. If you look at us, if you yeah, look at yeah, like, the business as a, as, if you look at topography like that, we have to make films that are different to what you get online. I think I don't want to make the same films as everybody else, and hence why you put those little elements in, just like me taking a piss out of him behind the camera. It just brings everything more. Filming's changed a lot over the last five years, I think. But um, it's nice to have that. It's not just uh, yeah. the cameraman aren't there, you know, because sometimes when you're following gyms, sometimes we make a film and the cameraman has absolutely no bearing on it. They don't need to be involved yeah. at all. Yeah, yeah. You know, we're there to serve a purpose. We're there to document what they're saying, what they're doing. They're telling a story. You don't need to hear my voice. My vo- I've got nothing to do with it. But if you're filming a live session with Jim and you're filming a live session, well, I'm there on that session, so I'm part of that. Yeah. Now, you have to be careful not to involve yourself too much, probably, because it's about gym and people want to know about gym. But actually, if you have a bit of a... There's things that happen on, behind camera that people are going to like, people are going to laugh. And they're not out of place because they are happening at the time. His mood will be based on how much therapy yeah. I'm giving him at the time, making him do this. Make, like, so your involvement as a cameraman on certain shoots is um, more warranted. Your involvement as a cameraman yeah. in the film is more warranted than others. Um, I also think you get like, you know, I'm definitely guilty of this, 100%. How I am in the office with those lads is different to how I am when I've got a camera in front of me and I'm presenting something. Mm. When you've got that type of shoot where you're, he, he, people don't necessarily know that they're being filmed. It's just how you are on the bank mm. fishing. That's like, you get that sort of realness yes. that you can't really, because it's the nature of someone sticks a camera in you, you're going to be the presenter or you're going to mm. try and, do you know what I mean? Whereas if, if you're literally just doing it and the camera's yeah. there, there might be some interaction, but it's just prompting a, a real sort of realness to the character, isn't it? Yeah. And like I say, and they're all just like, they're all things that have just, we've just tried to do as a, it's like, it's hard, it's hard to um, describe like what the sort of films we want to make are. And I've always wanted to make, but you say you want them to be real. You know, it sounds a bit weird and that, but we do. We just want them to be, we just want to document what's happening at the time. Or we're going to do an interview, retrospective type piece, where we're going to document what happened at that time. Yeah. So if you're talking about what happened at that time, you make it about that. But if you're talking about what's happening at the time, live and all that, then I think it doesn't hurt to involve... um, yeah, involve a bit, a bit of laugh and joke between the cameramen because they're funny. Like, yeah, life hasn't always got to be too serious, and I think certain films lend themselves to it. And Jim's films lend themselves perfectly to me being involved because he he bite on everything, <laughs> um, and it's funny, you know. Yeah, yeah, like, too right. And it's nice to make someone laugh when they're watching something. Yeah, you know. But sometimes people don't like it. You know, I had people message me about a lot we done when I went to broad with Jim. Someone was like, oh, it's just you two fucking talking in the van for, fine. I had hundreds of people messaging me saying they loved the van bit more than the fishing, you know, because we take, he's getting the ump in the van and the journey out there was me versus him almost. Like, But again, that goes back to you can't keep everyone happy. Yeah, yeah Al, says exactly. it. Al says him and Ollie yeah. is basically two blokes listening to drum and bass going and fishing abroad on a road yeah. trip. Yeah, And, and the people argue about you being in a van. Yeah, some people don't like, but some people love it. And exactly. I kind of always say, without being too blunt, it's like if you want to watch the, 
standard fishing film where someone goes to the lake, puts their rods out, catches carp, shows you how to tie a rig, shows you how to put their bait in, and then goes home. Like, that's not, like, we're not really about that. And mm-hmm. although that you could argue, yes, we do film guys go to the lake, put their bait in, put their rigs in, we're not, um, we're not constrained by a need to make a film that contains a certain amount of fish or contains a certain amount of technical take yeah. home and stuff. It's, it, you can have a really good trip when nothing happens in terms of catching fish. You don't even talk about a rig. And for us, as topography, we can put that film out there and it can be enjoyable for someone to watch. As a brand, Nash, Fox, Corder, if you're making a film, mm-hmm. you do need to have an element of... Um, I'm not. It's not to say that you couldn't make those kind of films, because of course you could, but I think as a business that is making films to influence people to buy a tackle, to inspire them to use their products, it's, import, it's more important to, to a brand that they get that take home, that they see the angler using a rig, they see how they can tie it, how they can use it, the bait they're using, that... It's, that's more important um, when you're making films as kind of a secondary yeah. aspect of a business. Whereas for us, we're not. We're just making films. You know, I could go out, film someone, catch nothing for three days and film all the weird shit that happened along the way and we could just put it out as a film. Yeah. Kind of doesn't work as well for a brand to do that. For, uh, you know, for a tackle brand or a bait brand to do that. There has to be a, um, there has to be a bit more to take from it, I think. Um, and I think that's kind of, we've got, we've got a bit of an artistic license in that sense. Yeah, definitely. We can just kind of, you can make good of something that was bad on the fishing front with, a, with the shit that happened around it. Yeah. And we have done loads of times, you know, There's what about, time. what about starting typography? You mm. obviously at Corder, we left off ages ago talking about you at Corder yeah. back when, at the start of the, the podcast, what prompted the decision to to sort of go? I'm going to go. I'm going to do it. Um, I just wanted to make so I've <clears throat> I've kind of discussed it in the past, but basically, when I started at Cord, I, I progressed through different roles. Yeah, I did customer service. Then I went into the media team, which was articles and writing. Times changed. You start doing filming, um, and I got to the point where I was happy. I was filming. I was confident in my filming. We were we would often go out with the guys from Sky, yeah, who weren't anglers, um, so they would make films based on, I guess, kind of what the direction they were given from Dan, etc. But making films back then was there was a lot less of it going on, wasn't so much to take inspiration from, but we were involved in these shoots quite a lot, and then as Corda grew, our media team became more involved in making film and being the person I am, I'm quite artistic. I'd kind of done it with the photography. When I went into the photography side of things, I look at everything that is being done. How's a rig sequence shot? How can we make a rig sequence better to look better? You might shoot the same thing and change the background. I remember everything at first we used to be shot on white. It looks a bit shit. Then everything used to be shot over like hook packets. You'd always like set the aperture to the camera so that, the product was in the background of the shots. So you'd mm. have like someone tying a hook on and you'd see the hook packet in the background and that, which I thought looked a bit shit. And then I, so I started shooting stuff more with uh, like low depth of field, blurry backgrounds, just nice greens and that in the background. So your eye was, your eye was more on the subject than the background. Little silly things like that, that you just kind of do, you know, Rich, Jimmy, we were all a bit like that. Like how can we make our cover shots better? How can we, we'd like, we'd like learn a new angle we could shoot a fish at and fucking exhaust it over the next six months because <laughs> it was different. And then we'd move on to something different. And that progression of just trying to make things, it keeps it interesting for me personally. Mm. We started doing all the video stuff anyway. The video became more and more. Um, and then being surrounded by the Sky TV guys, obviously they weren't cameramen. We then had an artistic license to go and shoot our own content for Corda. Stuff on the mags was dropping back Ali's um, value of magazine articles was starting to deteriorate in terms of uh, when you comp- compare that to what a video on 
the internet mm. might do. And obviously working under Ali, we were then kind of pushed down that road, which again was like a whole new world for us. All of a sudden, we're filming. We're not yeah. taking pictures anymore, we're filming. This is like... Massive change. Yeah, this is non-stop from four till, from light till light, from light till dark every day. Dark till dark, whatever you want to say, all day. Capturing everything that's going on. And with time, you start to... Again, me naturally, you start to do it. You learn how to do it. Once you've learned how to do it, you want to do it better. Once you, but then obviously, what happens when you work in a summer like Gorda is there's a there's a certain remit of stuff that you have to do. There's a certain style that needs to be done. There's a certain you're paid to do a certain job. If you're in the media team, your job is to make people buy a tackle. You know, it, it sounds blunt, but that is your yeah. job. <laughs> you know, that is what the if you're company's a, if based, you, yeah, if cool. you're a bait brand and you are, and you are the media man of the bait, your job is to make people buy the bait. This is you can gloss it up as much as you want. That's what you're there for. Yeah. You can make all the most wonderful films in the world if they don't sell you any tackle. You're not doing your job well. So we had the you know we had the um, we had the freedom to a degree to make um, these films look as good as we could. Could go out with good good anglers. We could do it, but we were still at heart a tackle brand. And Dan is extremely focused on the anglers learning from the films. He wants anglers, and he has always been that way. It's all about take home. It's all about influencing guys and helping them catch more fish. And he is like that, whether people think he is or not. That is, I can vouch for him and say. That that's the most important thing to Dan, what the angler um, gets from stuff. Mm. So as time went on, we've been making films and articles for quite a long time that were very much instructional led. They'd always be centered around like a rig or doing something or do it like a method, a go into a lake, showing them how to use this rig and tie this rig. And for me, per, for me, it just became a little bit samey my mind starts wondering uh wondering you know what else could what else can we do and yeah then i just started to think well i think we could do these kind of films no one really does these kind of films like this is back in the day when no one even did no one did um recorded interview you know that not that hadn't been done no one had been sat down like we're sat down now making a video of us talking no one had even done that it sounds so silly yeah but it hadn't been done maybe like once or twice or a ve- very occasionally but it wasn't like a thing making films that were just about going fishing with that the like the just the fun of fishing and the and the the fishing at the center and the heart of it all wasn't really done because the people making the films were tackle brands or bait brands or, um, and if it was done, it wasn't done regularly. It wasn't the sort of content that you can consume on a weekly basis. So yeah. let's say sticky baits, Corda, Nash, if they all went and done a really inspirational film, you'd only get that once, might be once a year or yeah, twice a year or, you know, it wasn't done regularly. And, so it was a combination of like being able to um, make the films I wanted to make, have an have a that artistic license again to do something a bit different, try something new, do what I wanted to do in my head. Um, that was very appealing because, as I said to you before, doing the same thing time and time again is not appealing yeah, to not, me. Yeah. Um, and I think if I was at Corda now things might be different. They're a much broader, they're, they're far broad. They've grown with, you know, they've grown astronomically. Maybe if I was there now, I would have been less inclined to start thinking that way about stepping away from Corda. Um, but at that time, however many years ago it was, that's what my, you know, that's what I started to think. Hey, if I want to do this and I really want to do it pro like, do it properly, then I have to leave Corda. So that's what I did. Big Basically. risk, though, no? Yeah, yeah. I, How did you feel about that? I didn't. I didn't see it as a risk because I was certain I would. I was certain it was going to be popular. This is a time when you've got 
Do you have a nipper at this time? No, missus, though, aren't you? No, I didn't have a kid. No. You didn't have a kid. So you, no, you, I you w- and your missus, basically, and yeah, you thought, I'm going to do it. Yeah, so my missus was going to. Um, what was my missus going to do? We worked out. My missus always had a pretty decent job, to be fair. Like, and we worked out that if shit hit a fan, she'd be able to. We wouldn't, get, we wouldn't be bang, bang in trouble. It wouldn't have been great. But circumstances allowed. A- yeah. Yeah, yeah, and my okay. mum and dad, like I said, my mum and dad are well educated. Like my mum's an accountant, and my dad's an author. Like I was, I am in a fortunate position, and was in a fortunate position where mm. my life was never going to go down the pan if it failed. And also, if it had failed, I would have just got a job back in the industry. Yeah, yeah, of course. So I don't look at things like that. You know, yes, my mum and dad would have been able to help us to a degree. Yes, my missus' job would have covered us to a degree. But actually, I can just get my own job back somewhere else. If Corda wouldn't have me back, I'd have found somewhere else. Yeah. Because I'd have had to. So it wasn't so much about what if it fails because I didn't have that mentality. I genuinely believed that people would enjoy it. Yeah. Um, if I did it, how if I put, you know, obviously me and Rich, I couldn't have asked for someone better to have by my side doing it with. Yeah. I was excited about doing it. And all those negative thoughts, I'm not that kind of person. So if I want to do something, I will try my best to do it. And that was very much what it was about. Like like I say, I had I did have the security that I knew that in the back of my mind I knew that if it fails after six months and I'm at a point where I you know So basically I took a big loan out, personal loan. Yeah. Um I took a big personal loan out. And I had to pay, obviously, I had to pay that back monthly. Um, so we had certain things that I, I, we had to cover. And beyond that, I just always, you know, I just thought, well, if you're going to do it, you've got to do it. If it goes wrong, goes wrong. You don't, you know. Nothing ventured, nothing The same gained. for anyone who's ever gone self-employed. Yeah. You know, and I'm sure there's loads of people out there listening now that you might work for a guy, you might be a, fen- make fe- be a fencer. There's nothing to say if you just jacked your job in and just set up your own fencing business you couldn't do it but not everyone wants to do it not everyone wants the responsibility of having to do that yeah of course and obviously the bigger something gets the more involved something gets and you then have to make lots of decisions beyond just when I look at what topography was back then when it first started it's a lot simpler then than it, what it is now there's a lot more going on there's a lot more to worry about there's a lot more people to worry about you've got a lot more even just content yeah. You know, you've got more responsibility. But also, I have more desire and drive all the time to do things better. So it doesn't bother me because I don't want it to sit still. No. Like, so that doesn't bother me. All those things that come with it, I don't mind that because that's what I want. Whereas some people aren't looking for that. Some guys want to do a job. Yes. Nine to five every day. Go home, go to work. Go home, go to work. That's what they want. If you're that kind of person, it's probably not for you. But if you're not, and you're, and you're, I think people will probably, I think there's a lot of people that probably underestimate the like their own ability. Um, but I'm not really like that. I would always try my best. So, but you see it with like individuals. I've been fortunate enough to have a lot of them, obviously, on this couch, including yourself. But you never really know what you can do until you 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 let yourself sort of out there. A lot of people will work at like. 50% and never really explore that other. Mm. And that could be through whatever circumstance. Yeah. I'm not I'm not saying that everybody needs to or, or can. And, and also, man, it's every chance. Like, if my missus didn't have a good job at the time, mm. if my mum and dad, if my mum was an accountant and my dad wasn't an author, then maybe I wouldn't have done it. I can't say that, that that didn't have an oh. inf- that didn't have an, in- I can't say that that didn't have an influence on me because whether you realise it or not, it will in the back of your mind. Like, so yes, that would, so if you're not in that position, maybe these decisions could be much harder and maybe I wouldn't have done it. But when I look back, I didn't, I never, you can't step into something thinking, what if this doesn't work? For me, that's just like, no, you know, I think if you're going to walk a tightrope and you step onto your first step thinking, what if I die? You'll probably fall off it. Probably going to die. You step onto it thinking, right, I've got to get to the other side, then maybe you will, you know? Yeah. You've it's done very that, much though, mentality, right? you know. I um, remember thinking, well, I remember seeing it go and, and going live and thinking, 
fair play, like paying for content. Because this is a time that YouTube was rife. There was so mm. much free content. Yeah. And from that point, it's been absolutely, like the rise has been mega. It's probably more now, free content. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty more now. <laughs> In a way, it? we're probably more up against it now than we, we were then. You've not just got free content now, you've got the prevalence of other paid platforms. Yeah, there's other people you? doing it. You've got, there's a lot more now. What What's your thoughts on that? The, the sort of, there's two things. One thing is a lot of people videographers especially there's been a tendency now to go freelance and do work in various means like you and rich did pretty much from from the get-go yeah. back then and there's also the rise of different other paid mm. platforms there could be individual angler platforms there could be other bigger yeah. conglomerates of anglers if you like what, what are your thoughts around all that in the marketplace i think industry is big enough for more than one um i think competition is good mm. um i've had my had my ups and downs with it all based on friendships, things like that, which which I'm not going to go into as such. Um, people will know me well enough, will know the things around it that have ups, that have bothered me. Right. Um, but I do think the industry is big enough for more than one. And my opinion now is... If you do it for the, if you do it for a good reason, you will stand the test of time. People will stand the test of time. If you do things for the right reasons, then I think there'll be these people doing it will will last the length of time. I yeah. think um, it's probably easy to look in uh, on something new, different, and think, oh, I'll have a bit of that. And I hear things all the time. This person's going to do it. That person's going to do it. Part of me thinks I don't think you'd have I don't think you'd be able to because I don't think you've got knowing what it takes I don't think you've got that and I don't think it's very it can be acquired very easily mm. but at the same time I could be totally wrong and that person who I hear oh he's going to do it they might have everything it takes and that's my bad judgment I know what it takes to do it and it's not easy it's easy to do it, it can be kind of easy at the start when you've only got to think about, as I said earlier, things change, there becomes a lot more to deal with. But I don't begrudge people for wanting to do something to make a living out of something. You know, if an angler wants to do it to make it, then it is what it is. Who am I to say that he shouldn't? Um, Yeah, like there's going to be more people. The first carp magazine... I'm sure there was one, and then there was how many was there in the end? Yeah, you know? right. My my main worry now is just do what we do and make us better. Um, do you pay attention to the others much or not? I've unf- I don't follow them. No. So you you don't have the influence of all that. No, I still see bits and pieces because people talk. I get the odd person say it. St- things still do pop up. Yeah. Um. But I've tried to just unfollow him. Yeah, your focus is on your yeah, um, yeah. I've uh, I, I try not to pay too much. Do you know what? As well, what I see is nice. I see some nice stuff. Yeah, from the other people, the people that are doing it. There obviously there aren't that many. Um, that t- I think the content they do is different to us. Yeah. Um, I think I will name them. Um, I think Carp Fix's content is more mainstream than ours is. High production level, yeah. more mainstream um, in terms of the content. The guys that are on there, what the subject matter is, I think it's more, it's a more mainstream vibe than what we have. I think Joe Morgan, who I don't actually isn't paid for now, I think is, I think is free again. Yeah. Carpenter. His content is really good. It's like, it's interactive. It's, the production level is not as high. Mm. The, like the you know the, that side of it, but the what you get from the films is really good. The vibe, him as a character, yeah. Um, and I don't know, is anyone else doing it? They're the two that I think of when you say to me, "What do you think?" You yeah, know? yeah. Um, so I think they're quite. I think both of them are quite different to us. Um, like I say, Carp Fix, it's a good production level. The content for me is different to what we do, so. But it's essentially, not really, the sort of content that we do either, and essentially, the marketplace is big enough to cater for it all. Mm, for sure, I think it's all about 
you just it's all about your content, isn't it? Mm. And that mainstream type content is what typically I would say that's the more common type of content that you will see everywhere today. And that's what we've always been different to. We've never gone down the road of um, making videos that are just uh, that are largely about people going fishing, the technical side of it. And that, because at the time when we started topography, that was what there was anyway. And I think um, I think what carp fix do in comparison to what we do are different in terms of their probably who their sub uh, target audience is and who our target audience yeah, is. Yeah. So can we exist side by side? Yeah, of course we can. We're not headbutting in terms of clashing with our content. I do believe they're quite different. Um, yeah, I'd say so, mate. You know, they're not. I don't think we. I don't think our films are the same. I don't think they're um, aimed at the same people. As a generalization, yeah. Don't get me wrong. There's certain stuff we'll make that probably is similar to them, and vice versa. But I think on the whole. Um, they're quite and it's quite instructional what they do, whereas we're a bit more diverse, maybe. In your content and everything you filmed for you, mm. funny stories, standout characters, chapters, anything that that really resonates. You've done an awful lot. If you look through your, your sort of categories and and sort of catalog of of content, there's loads there, mate. Any shockers? <laughs> no. No, because no, it is a big shout to like like the session, for example. You go out mm. with an angler; it's a big shout. Like you say, you can put a lot of it out without having the captures, but there's a lot on sort of cards, camera crew, all that sort of technical side of stuff. Any as well. shockers? What things gone wrong? Yeah. Well, the people that work with me know that if something goes wrong, <laughs> it's um, it's it's something that upsets me. So I think we all try collectively not for every, not to have too many things go wrong. We had a podcast deleted the other week. That was pretty bad. Oh, we recorded it in the cut, and it just corrupt. It just disappeared. I think the, I think Bridger turned the camera off before the. I don't know what happened. No, come out of a warning. We were like, just press OK, press OK, and it just deleted the clip. Oh. It was like an hour and twenty minute clip. That's that was pretty shit. You had to film it again, didn't you? Straight yeah. after. Fucking pain in the ass. Try having the same conversation twice. Imagine now if this went. We had I to, smart. If it does, I'm not like doing that. it. By the way, you definitely are, mate. Um, <laughs> uh. We haven't really ever had anything too bad happen. I've had a few personal dramas, like I say, just missing trains or forgetting stuff, but we've never had anything like, I don't think catastrophic that's like ended a shoot or... Mm. Um, what about significant chapters in there? You've had Richie McDonald, you've had Lee Jack, you've had some amazing... Yeah, I'd say our most significant things, if I look back, I think the early for the record interviews, mm. I think they're pretty significant in terms of... Um, the content that was available at the time, doing something a bit different. Now it's not. If you come to the fishing scene now, look at all the videos out there. Our four the records are similar to what we're doing now. They're similar to loads of other content of this form, like your podcast. They're yeah. kind of a podcast, a little bit more formal than a podcast, I would say. And we're very fortunate to have Rich, who is, has an encyclopedia <laughs> of knowledge in terms of carp fishing, carp anglers, and the scene as a whole. Um, but I think the footer record interviews was quite a big thing in terms of for its time. So I look back on and I'm proud of them. Richie McDonald, a big thing. Yeah. Kind of, you know, bringing him back out. Cause since that interview, yeah, he's back on the scene. You know, he's like, Cord have took him under their wing. He's like, when that we interview was what? Mate, Can when we... we met Richie, mate, he was in a pretty bad way. Yeah. And I'm sure he won't mind me saying that. Mm. Like, he was probably at a point in his life now where he'll look back and he'll, you know, he's in a much better place now. And it's good to see, like, I think when we saw him, he was like at the tail end of a bad part of his life. Mm. And from that moment, he's, I think like from that moment he did an interview of us, everyone warmed to him. It kind of, it, it's brought him back to the scene. Loads of people have wanted a bit of Richie in their life since that interview. And for good reason, because he's a great character mm. and he's been taken under his wing by good people that are looking after him. And that's nice. When I look back at that and I think, well, if we hadn't done that interview, would that have happened? Maybe not. And that's nice to think that about someone because you're having an effect on someone's life. Jim is a big one for us, you know, because and for me personally, because 
I know it's given people a different look on him and that's affected his life, which is nice. Um, the other content that we do and the films that we've made, you know, we've had some great laughs. We've done, you know, we've done, we've done all sorts of different stuff with all sorts of guys. We've documented people that are people that people wouldn't have heard of or known about. And, yeah. and that they're important to me. You pick the likes of Jamie Smith, you know, that's important to me that we have people like him on. Um, it's nice in a sense that we put their their life, we document it and it's there forever then. And that was kind of what we got into. It was like, right, and that's why now when we're looking at people's interview now, we're kind of going a little bit more off the... Yeah. Off the... Main channel, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because there's so much of this style of content available, it's like, right, okay, let's play to our strengths here. Let's use the connections that we have got through being not only in the industry in a long time, but actual, you know, quite obsessive anglers ourselves. You meet lots of strange characters along the way. When it comes to for the records, they're the kind of people, the sort of the less obvious people now that we're aiming that out because I know from statistics on our website, which I've never really paid too much attention to because we've always, and again, without sounding too cliche, it's always been about making films we want to make more than making films that everyone loves. Yeah, yeah. But you can't survive as a as a company making films if the films you make not everyone likes. Mm. If no one's watching them, you're soon going to go down the pan. Hence why we've always tried making content that's different to what's available on YouTube. So we've got a... But those, those interviews, the For The Record interview, statistically perform less than our average live videos and stuff do. They're not as popular, but they are popular for a certain part of our audience, yep. which I would call our bread and butter. The people that we aimed topography at at the start was the niche. It was all about that um, smaller group of more accomplished carp anglers. We were, it was all about them at first. As we've grown as a company, we've broadened our horizons and we now try to make a, variety of content that kind of appeals to both but the for the record because it gets viewed by those kind of anglers we have more scope to get guys on that the masses wouldn't have heard of because the masses aren't really going to listen to those interviews anyway yeah 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 do you see what i'm saying so if we make a rig film we do it at a popular lake with a popular angler if we do an interview that's not going to get listened to by them we do it with so it's more as we've gone on Oh, sorry. It's you've sticking, it. yeah. sticking to our roots, sticking yeah. to what we're what we have always been and always will be about, and just making sort of if doing the content, doing each type of content as best as we can do it to suit who you're aiming it at. I suppose yeah. so you're getting the best from that content. That's what I'm trying to say. So the for the record fans would be less interested in um, a. a big name maybe than they would a uh, sort of underground kind of guy. Yeah. Whereas the mass market would be much more interested in the big name than they are an underground guy. But because it's an interview, they're not that interested in that content. They yeah. want to see that big name fishing. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's all about, we do more of that now. Aim the, the aim the right things at the right people. Um, but yeah, that interview series has been great. We've met loads of great characters. Um, and <laughs> we've had some funny ones. Lewis Reed's one was quite funny. Everyone's, if no one's watched that and you remember, watch Lewis Reed interview. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, and, um, we're just looking for, we're always looking for different things we can do. And Future things. for you? You're now in a diff different position. You've got a successful sort of business. There's a lot of plates to spin. You've also got a bigger family life and everything mm. in, involved in that. What's What's the... Well, What's the goal? What's the drive now? I don't want any more children. Two is enough. <laughs> so my family is as big as it needs to be. Um, is that Gemma's vote on that as well, mate? Yeah, she's sticking it to. Well, she's one of them mum. She's one of those motherly mums, you know. So she'd probably have eight kids and deal with them. But it's two is a good number for us, you know. It's, yeah, it's, suits. I'm away a bit. Yeah, exactly. You don't want three of them little things running around if you're only on your own. Laura, that's my missus. Three versus um, one. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> She'll three tell you well. Three versus one is trouble. Two versus one, it's 
a one on each hand, isn't it? I suppose. I reckon Gem will handle it, mate. Laura's an absolute force. Ridiculous. So, yeah, no more kids. Um, I want, I want to get, oh, I want to get my fishing back. That I've, not, I kind of lost it a little bit. Not, I've not lost my fishing, but I've, I've lost my intensity of fishing that I used to have over the last couple of years. Yeah, partly because of COVID, partly because of the business growing and having to, and wanting to expand things, more people. Um, that takes up more time. Yeah, I want. But I feel like we're getting towards, for a long time, we've had a lot of people at Topography doing a bit of this, a bit of that. And I've tried for for the last couple of years to bring everything around so people, he does that, he does that, I do that. And it's a bit more streamlined. Um, but because I've always chosen my friends to work with, like years ago I trained, I had Dave Robinson as a cameraman, trained him pretty much from scratch to the point where he's like, pretty capable with a camera. Um, he then had a baby and he left uh, to work closer to home. Mm. He's in the building trade now. I works closer to home, so sort of lost him. Um, around that time, I took on my mate Bridger, the guy I met, I said years ago, I used to lie to all the time and held yeah. it against me. We took him on to do social media and whatnot he's really good with ideas. He was always like, he's one of those guys that would always be like, oh, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? What about this for an idea? You should do this. You should do that. And he was a sparky at the time. And if, after a while, I'm like, we need someone that's going to do, oh, we, we need someone like him. Oh, but he's a sparky. And most people would go, oh, oh you can't do it then because he's a sparky. But that's not the case, you know. So I was like, Bridger, do you want to do this job? So he jacked in being a sparky and he comes to work with us. Long story short, turns out, yes, he's good at ideas. He ain't very good at writing. He's fucking most disorganised human being I've ever met in my life and organising and dealing with all that social media all that website stuff is not for him Rich came in and said he's disorganised he is he's a fucking yeah he's as bad as Bridget no I, maybe mm, not as bad as Bridget yeah that's just what Rich is like yeah he's disorganised I didn't think that when I looked he, like, and I'm the polar opposite like you must be... I'm super organised. Yeah. Like when I get home, I take all my camera kit out, I put it all back in the bag, I charge everything all at once, and when I go to a shoot, all my cards are... Click, like It's all done, lovely. Whenever we turn up for the, for the record interviews with Rich, he's like, oh, I don't know where my tripod plate is, and I'm thinking, oh, no, where's it going to be? Or I've forgotten this, or... You know, he's always got it, but he never knows where it is. Whereas me, it's all in my box. It's all lined up neatly, and I know it's yeah. there. So they're just differences in people. But it's not the end of the world. Like, it does my head in a little bit because I'm like, oh, yeah. is it going to, oh, are we going to find it? But we always find it and so it doesn't matter. I can't live like that. I can't be disorganised. I, well, I try not to be. So Bridger, with all the will in the world, is not an organised type of person. Like Rich is not an organised type of person. Very good at many things. Mm. Strengths, like superior strengths in many things. Weaknesses in other and so Bridger, we basically we trained him up to do that and he was doing all the social media and whatnot. So we've now changed that. So I've, I've spent 18 months invested in him. He, he works with me every day at my house in the office. 18 months in whatever he's invested in him. Just got it to the point where you think, right, this is when he'd like, he's really going to come good. Yeah. But you then realise, actually, it's make or break now because this is the point where he should be able to just like do it do this yeah. and then you think he can't it's not for him if I'd have not chosen Bridger at the start and I'd have just got a guy in who can do who is organised who has it on their CV has proved by previous jobs that they're really organised on a computer and all that that wouldn't have happened I would have got 18 months in and they probably but what I wouldn't have got is a guy that loves my loves topography like as his own mm. It's mine and my good friends. It's someone I can work with day to day. Someone I enjoy working with. Someone I can have a go at and he can have a go back at me. And then that's what I wouldn't have got. Those things are far, far more important to me. And also, if, I, if I'm going to have success and do well, I, there's no one I want to share it more with than my friends. Yeah. Hence Dave, training him from scratch. Didn't really have to do that. But it was an, he wanted to do it. Therefore, great, let's do it. Unfortunately, things change. He now, like I say... I had to step away. So Bridger, he now is, I'm now training him to be a cameraman and an editor. So 
I've taught him bits of editing over the time and little yeah. bits of camera work. So now all that 18 months, that's basically, right, Bridger has nothing to do with any of that now. That's all down the drain, basically. He served a purpose at the time. He's done as best of it as he could. It caused me headaches, which in turn caused him headaches. So what do you do? You carry on with that, try and make something work that isn't going to. What some people might do is they might get rid of the guy. Yeah. He can't do that job. I'm going to get rid of him and I'm going to get someone else in that can do that job. But he's your mate. You're not going to get rid of him. And also I see in those 18 months, I saw attributes in him that I ain't going to get very, I'm not going to get from anyone else, let alone have the privilege of it being my friend. So now it's like, right, he's definitely going to be more on the artistic side and I'm teaching him to edit and I'm teaching him to be a cameraman. So I've now basically starting from scratch, like I did with Dave. Like you kind of starting from scratch again. Fair play. By Bridger now not doing that role, Gemma now works with us. So Gemma now works with us and she's now learning all that. So she's not so even... She's doing the social media side. Well, I write everything. I write all the social media. I, I basically... Everything people see, what I call the face of topography, everything you see in terms of content comes through me nowadays. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, all the videos come to me. I watch everything. I make notes with changes, blah, blah, blah. The the guys like Rich and that, they shoot a lot of it, film it, uh, shoot it, edit it. I do still shoot and I do still edit, just not as much. Yeah. But it's predominantly those guys. It then comes to me. I look over it all and basically then before that film goes out, there's website pages to make, there's social media posts, there's all that front of house stuff that I was suspecting Bridget, to, that was the plan was for Bridget to do. I'm now writing it all and Gemma is the sketch, like she does all the scheduling, all the back end stuff. So the, yeah, because as much as I am organized, I'm a very much an artistic kind of guy. So I'm organized to a degree. Spreadsheets blow my brains out. I don't like all that. You know, I'm good at putting things in folders and color coordinating everything and everything, like, things like that. I like yeah, that. It looks That's pretty. a bit of my OCD. Yeah. But it, Gemma is very good at that. That's what she's always done. She, she worked, used to work for the NHS. Um, What's it like working but, with your missus? It's good, mate. I like it. She's, is it? And she's always been heavily involved because she's always been my... When I go in at night, I don't... Because I don't turn a... I don't yeah, shut the of office door and go, oh, let's talk... I'm still... I shut the office door and I'm thinking or doing stuff on my phone or I don't shut off. So she's always been involved. It's not... It's not... doesn't feel too different. Don't get me wrong. There'll come times where it will clash, I'm sure. But she now... Um, so she now does all that. So when you say, oh, you know, what do you think for the future? What I'm hoping is we're at a point now where we've got the right people doing the right jobs. Yeah. I'm going to be doing this, all the stuff I'm doing now with more time to go fishing and whilst in being able to do my work from the bank, which I know I can, bring that element of my fishing back into my life that I kind of have lost a little bit over the last... 18 months or so because there's been so much when I used to work at home on my own it didn't matter I just I didn't have any reliance mm. now when there's people at home and I'm leaving home I'm thinking about them what is going on there is everything okay so I'd like to think that topography will keep growing I always want it to grow and that's through it's not because of money and again it sounds cliche it's because how many members and stuff we have that is my. That is how we measure the enjoyment that people get, how good a job we're doing, and ultimately how um, worth it my investment is. You know, if you're heavily invested in something, you put loads of effort into it. You want it to do well, don't you? But surely you know? there's going to be some sort of saturation point where that need that. A sort of market target market with the current you make mm. with the content you make is is pretty much signed up but i'm not i don't i just don't look at it like that i don't care how do you look I, at I it i just don't want it to go backwards oh okay okay i don't care if we grow a couple a member yeah, a month yeah, yeah, yeah. as long as we don't go backwards right you know that's because if you'd have said to any any company years ago like the saturation point, like how do you measure that? What is it? Like, I'm yeah. sure what, what is that down to? Like, and if you hit a saturation point and you're doing something, and this is what I sort of go back to, like we're always trying to do more and better. And if you hit a saturation point, doing what you're doing, add something else to the mix, change what you're doing, 
bring something else in. You know, there's no reason to like stagnate. Yeah, like if you just like look at Dan Fairbrass or anyone, all the, like Nashi, all these people, they they started with a product. Yeah, a product, and they would have saturated it with that product. But now, and then they go. We'll do another product, yeah, do yeah. another product, we'll do this, we'll make videos, let's do that. Like, And I'm not saying topography is going to become a tackle brand because it's not. Um, but in terms of content, in terms of what we offer our members, what we offer, like, we're always looking, and I certainly will always be looking just to do things, just to do things a bit better than before because otherwise it does get boring. Um, and it's fun. Yeah. To me, it's fun. Yeah, I like yeah, it. You can see that. I think... Um, I love just, just like I spend a lot of time doing things that are probably pointless because I feel like people might like them and then my missus and that they're like no one gives a fuck about that Elliot <laughs> and I'm like well I do so sometimes you know you just it keeps me keeps me occupied and that um, but yeah I think in terms as long as there's people watching fishing videos yeah which there are hundreds of thousands of yeah there's always there's always people that you know there's always a room to to have another guy watching it enjoying the films like that's and like I say until we start going backwards um I'll be happy and if we start going backwards I'll be try I'll just try even harder to make to push us forwards again you know um yeah, fair play mate and that's what I'll always, and it, you know if it went backwards and backwards and backwards I'm the sort of guy that would just probably just like bottle it you know because that would that would really bother me yeah I don't know I can't imagine being. I'm sure there'll be people that have like had a business or had a something like that they that they put could be a marriage or anything. Like I've never had anything in my life where it crumbles around me. Yeah, and the thought of that scares me. It does because I'm not the sort of person that deals with that sort of thing well, mm. and I wouldn't deal with it well with topography if all of a sudden the members just started going through the floor. Everyone said they didn't like what they're seeing, like that would really bother me to a point of like, it would eat me up. I think that's why you're doing well. But at though. the same time, I don't think that will ever happen because I'm like that. Exactly. And I always will, you know, we talk to the people that we talk to our members. We take notice of what they say. We've always got, we're always trying our hardest to make everything better. And I think as long as you live your life that way, for me, I don't look, I'm never looking. I don't ever look to fail. I just always look to, succeed if I can just try your hardest and then what more can you do than that like mate I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed this rundown of fishing and like little look insight into you I can't say we've had many dealings over the past no. sort of two so it's been nice to sit with you and like no, I don't think I've ever met you get an insight I don't, I don't think. think we have met have we we must have somewhere a show or something we've briefly we probably. have actually yeah briefly yeah Only but briefly. like I haven't spent a great deal of time with you so it's been nice no. to get a full sort of an edited insight into me. Yeah. I thought it's going to be a bit more superficial, mate. We got pretty deep in some elements. Yeah, I'm there, like which that. Is good. <laughs> I like that. It's good. And um, before you go, mate, I've got ten quick fire questions um, oh, that you can't get out of, which you're going to love, mate. Because this is cliche and cringy, mate. Which is what you're all about. Uh, one of them, I know what you're going to ask me, and I thought long and hard about it. And I'm going to answer up. this question before people probably know what it is. I'm going to answer this question with. Um, uh, um, Oh God! Just ask. <laughs> what is going on here? Um, name three anglers, past or present, um, that you'd have on your dream sipography episode. Terry, uh, Jim, mm. oh, fuck! I did actually think of this. <laughs> Terry, Jim, and. <sighs> I don't know you that angle. <laughs> Would I be filming it or could I be involved? Because I'd say me, so I could sit with him. You're filming I've it. Never been, I've never touched Terry before. <laughs> you never touched never him. T- never been close enough to t- only once, and I didn't touch him. He stood near me. Stroke his hair. So I'd touch him. I'd be, <laughs> it'd be me, and I'd, I'd put I'd put my arm around Terry. Yeah. I'll let you include yourself, mate. Uh, best carp you've seen on the bank in the flesh? The dustbin from the carp lake. The dustbin. Yeah. Oh yeah. My mate James Davies caught it. One night in the pissing rain, shout Jeez. went out. Yeah, that we haven't one. even talked about your Yately adventures, have we, mate? No. That yeah, that that one, on. definitely that. Yeah, that is a pretty iconic carp. Uh, drum and bass or country and western? Drum and bass. And I'm not a drum and bass head. Just country. But and I do like it. Please. These boys here, the national, they're um decent. 
I used to hate drum and bass when I was a kid. Yeah, I don't like it. Though. I don't like the MC drum and bass, but their drum and bass is good. I actually like that. Is it? Yeah, I like it. Fair play to you. Uh, who'd win in a fight, you, Rich or Bridger? I would definitely beat Bridger and Rich would crush me, so. Rich is a big old yeah. unit, isn't he? So if it's, yeah, if fight to death between three of us, Rich would win. <sighs> yeah, fair play. But I reckon I could tire him out and then maybe, like, get him to sleep. Depends what terrain it was on. <laughs> if you've got some space to he's run. He's quite fast as well. But is he fast? Yeah, you'd be surprised. Yeah. No. Yeah. Is he? He is, yeah. He plays football a bit still as well. Jeez. Fast he prob- and massive. I'm going to say Rich. Yeah. Okay. Definitely bit. not Bridger, though. No. Uh, <laughs> fish only for wrong uns or never can't fish again. Okay, That's so... A, I think Rich said fish for wrong uns. Yeah, I know, did. I'm not going to say that. D- can I? Could I choose the fish that are wrong uns and bring them here to fish all myself? Or do you have to just... Is it by, like, what's currently here? What do you mean? So, fish are wrong uns, yeah, you said. If yeah. I was allowed to go abroad, take these no, wrong no, and bring no, them, no, 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 that's, no, 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 no. It's just based on what's here now. It's just based on based what on is... me look, sitting here now, looking at all the lakes I would say I've got wrong ones in. Yeah. I would, yeah, not fish. You'd not fish? Yeah. Not fish. Oh, that's a big call. I know it is, yeah. But I mean that, yeah. Fair. Because of the lakes, they're really, really busy. I find them a little bit soulless and I don't really, the fish don't appeal to me, no. Okay. Fish 20 years in the past or 20 years in the future? Past. We. Oui. Uh, in front or behind a camera? I don't really care. <laughs> you not? No. Nah. That's fair. Uh, in front, because it means I'm fishing rather than filming. But you prefer fishing to filming? Yeah. If I've got to film someone else fishing or be fishing myself, I might fishing. as well do the fishing myself. Dawn or dusk? Dawn. Dawn is when the sun... Is that coming up? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Dawn. Just because when it's going down, <laughs> yeah. mate. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Favourite Bankside food? Stir fry. Yeah. Uh, last question. Night in with the missus or night out on the bank? Night out on the bank. Gemma's a punisher. <laughs> you are yeah. horrible to Gemma. Oh, yeah, night out on Poor the bank. Poor Gem, mate. You have no. to work with your day She'd say well. the same. So it's, yeah. not, it's not like one of them ones where the missus would be like, oh, you're fucking out of order. She'd say 100% night out on the bank yeah. as well. So yeah, it's mutual. Night out on the bank and she don't even fish. <laughs> Night out Classic. On the bank. Elliot, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you guys for watching and listening. I'll be back soon with another Nash Off the Hook podcast. Make sure you check out Sipography if you don't already. And thank you very much once again, mate, for coming in. Thanks for having me.